good morning everybody i uh, will get started with the uh, program for the day uh, welcome to the continuing professional development in binocular vision and orthoptics hosted by the lv prasad eye institute hyderabad uh, thank you all so much for uh, becoming part of this uh, meeting on a sunday and i really appreciate the commitment that you have given to this program um, i also want to thank all of you by uh, telling you that we have had an extremely gen uh, big support from all of you for this program uh, within the first four days of us uh, advertising this program we had over 1200 participants register for this obviously our zoom connection cannot host this many number of participants and we have had to restrict the uh, restricted to a limited number and you are those uh, ones who are here in the program so without any further ado let me share the program schedule for all of you we hope that you have received the uh, prerequisite learning package along with all the other details that was there in the program uh, we will start the program uh, with uh, my introduction which i am currently doing this will be followed by a uh, talk by prem nandini sadguna on the importance of refraction in binocular vision followed by a couple of talks by me on uh, why accommodation and vergence interactions is important to understand from a binocular vision perspective and how do four years define the load on the binocular vision system these topics will then be taken will take a clinical angle and it will be discussed in the context of non strabismic binocular vision disorders by uh, vidisha bhattacharya we will take a break after this talk and following this we will start on our evidence based practice session that will be chaired by dr richa verma the idea of the second half of the session is to practically implement whatever we have learned in the morning and apply the concepts that we have learned uh, to a clinical scenario and in the context of uh, the current evidence that is available for uh, clinical practice uh, following this we will have the concluding remarks and we will all uh, uh, so i will uh, invite dr prem nandini sadguna for this uh, talk so prem nandini is an optometrist by training from the elite school of optometry has a masters and phd in vision science from the ohio state university school of optometry following this she Uh, did her postdoctoral training at the Scapens Eye Research Institute in Boston, uh, which is part of Harvard University. And uh, a few years uh, later, she joined the L. V. Prasad Eye Institute as a scientist at the Brian Holden Institute of Optometry and Vision Science. So, apart from doing some very exciting work in the area of uh, binocular vision and uh, low vision. Nandini also runs an orthoptics clinic every week and uh, and been successfully building her clinical practice as well with that i invite nandini to share her uh, slides and the first talk thank you shrikant as you can all see the title of my talk is importance of uh, refraction in binocular vision evaluation we will be covering the following uh, learning objectives we will understand why refraction is important in binocular vision we will learn few techniques to finalize the spectacle prescription specifically we will look at the three techniques which is dynamic retinoscopy borish delayed subjective and binocular balancing now i understand that we have a very assorted mixture of participants for some of you this might be purely a revision you might be already knowing stuff uh, but for others it might be you know this but you probably are not yet practicing so we will go over this at a pace where it appeals to everybody more so for the ones who don't practice it if i pose a question like this which is what is the number one complaint for binocular vision disorders in other words what is it that makes a patient come to your clinic where you're assessing their binocular vision or you're going to initiate an orthoptics or a vision therapy i am sure that most of you would agree that you know it's headache and eye strain that is what gets your patient to the clinic This is an interesting uh, systematic review article that was published in Ophthalmic and Physiological Optics in the year 2001 and it is titled why do we still not know whether refractive error causes headaches and this is towards a framework for evidence based practice so in today's workshop the flavor is going to be around this evidence based practice as and when we will pull out and give you an evidence for why we do certain things 
but uh, not many things in binocular vision, orthoptics and vision therapy actually has a complete evidence also. So we will try and navigate based on our own clinical experience or somebody's clinical eminence. And whenever available, we'll, we will go over the evidence. So as per this article, it turns out, so it reviewed several different articles. And one of the articles which they pulled out is Whittington's paper where they had almost 1,400 patients. And they said that 45% patients, so 45 of patients needing refraction actually complained of headache. And in Gordon's paper, uh, which had about 100 patients, they found that 28% of patients having headache in an ophthalmology practice were actually wearing improper spectacles. And one paper that came out of India in 1967 stated that 90% of headache was relieved when they were given the spectacles. So with this, it appears and it appeals that, you know, uh, giving a proper spectacle correction, doing that refraction is important as it could actually relieve somebody's headache. But it turns out that when they did the systematic analysis in this paper, they concluded to say the belief in uncorrected refractive error as an agent in the generation of headache has persisted throughout the 20th century. And yet, they, it, it is their view, the author's view, that this belief can neither be supported nor rejected by the available evidence. So even though they pulled out all these papers, there isn't still any evidence to strongly say that it is headache and refract refractive error are correlated. So I'm just putting this out there to give you the flavor for while we may have some articles stating this, we, may, we still have to critically look at these articles to see whether we agree with it or not. Okay, so getting back to the topic on why is refraction important in binocular vision. So even if we go with our own experience and say that headache can be probably fixed with refraction, it brings us to this situation where we are not monocular animals. So we don't see an image either clear or blur. Rather, we are binocular creatures. And so our problems are two times more. So we either see two clear images or one clear, one blur, and several permutation combination for this. So we all know this book, Shyman and Wick, if you're ever interested in binocular vision, this would be one of the books that you would be looking at. And uh, this book and any other, uh, you know, books that talks about practicing and managing uh, binocular vision problems would always first emphasize on a good refraction. And so to do good refraction, I would highly recommend this book by Milder and Rubin. They are uh, two ophthalmologists who wrote this fantastic book. Somebody, some people might be already familiar with this book. It's called The Fine Art of Prescribing Glasses without making a spectacle of yourself. And of course, the Borish clinical uh, refraction textbook. Now, the reason why we are doing the binocular vision evaluation, eventually the ultimate goal of all this orthoptics vision therapy is to establish a comfortable and clear single vision for our patients. So the focus on today's or of my talk today is essentially on the clear aspect. So the way to achieve clear vision is by doing a good refraction. And this needs to be done even before we diagnose a binocular vision disorder. I've seen some practitioners, when they know that the spectacle correction is not appropriate, they also jump in to measure other binocular vision parameters. But we need to actually wait, give the appropriate spectacle correction, call back the patients, and then we and then we do the binocular vision assessment. So uh, if you're familiar with the study that came out of Shankar Netralia called the BAN study, that's what they did in their protocol too. They gave the spectacles first and they went back after two weeks and checked the binocular vision parameters of the children. Now you might think that why am I stressing this so much to a, a group of optometrists who probably are doing all this already? Well, it turns out that that's, you know, even as eye care professionals, I don't think we sometimes fully understand the value of refractive error. So I'll give you a quick clinical example. So this was one of our colleagues, uh, he's 35 years old, ophthalmologist. So he came to our clinic because he was having a lot of eye strain and he wasn't able to really do his cataract surgeries properly. So he would actually do one surgery, go out, drink coffee, try to beat the headache. And then when he measured his own near point of convergence, he found his NPC was receded. So he went up doing pencil push-up exercise, which did not benefit. And therefore, he came to our binocular vision orthoptics clinic. And we found that he was an uncorrected hypropia. And all he needed was a simple pair of spectacles. 
I also have examples of optometry students who have gone to neurologists, got an MRI done, and then ended up just wearing a simple pair of spectacles, either for their uncorrected astigmatism or for their hyperopic error. So never underestimate the value of doing a good refraction. We need to do good refraction in binocular vision because it gives you equal visual acuity in each eye, which will then become a fusion enabler. When we equalize the retinal image quality in, in each of the eye, that also becomes a fusion enabler. We have the evidence for this because the extreme example when the image quality is not good or when the visual acuity is not equal between the two eyes, then the patient can end up with anisometropic amblyopia. So we know the importance of why we need to establish e e almost equal visual acuity or equal retinal image quality in both eyes so that we can enable fusion and then therefore we can have a comfortable, clear single binocular vision. So when we talk about refraction, we also need to touch upon objective refraction. Corboy is a good book that talks about the retinoscopy technique, so I'll not go into that. But I'll just stress upon a couple of few important things we need to keep in mind when we do the objective refraction. One is the fogging lens. So we need to put this working distance lens, typically plus one and a half diopter sphere, if we are working at a distance of 66 centimeter in both eyes. And that's important. I've heard some people say that they put it in one eye as contralateral fogging and they would refract the other eye. And their uh, theory is that, oh, the contralateral fog will help the other eye also to relax accommodation. If that theory were true, then why is it that the eye without the fogging lens can accommodate and it will induce a contralateral accommodation? So that logic doesn't hold much water. So it's better to put the fogging lens in both eyes and then do the refraction, the objective refraction. Also, there are certain very experienced senior optometrists who would just do a quick scope and right away they would know what the refractive error is. While that is great, when it comes to seeing patients in the binocular vision, orthoptics, vision therapy clinic, it will be important that you spend a few seconds to observe the quality of the reflex. See for its brightness, see for the stability, see for the regularity. They say that a retinoscope to an optometrist is like the ophthalmoscope. So we can observe a lot more from the eye by doing retinoscopy. And it's also important to decide when to do a cycloplegic refraction. And Fine Arts book actually, you know, goes gaga over cycloplegic refraction. Please keep in mind that cycloplegic refraction is not necessarily reserved for children. You can do it on any age group. Okay, so when it comes to subjective refraction, we know that prescribing spectacles is both an art and a science. And this is why autorefractors will never substitute an optometrist because it's the optometrist and the patient together who have to work with the patient in order to arrive at the final spectacle prescription. So a same patient on two different examiners may vary in the, in the outcome of the subjective refraction. And even on a same patient, same examiner, they still can vary from one day to another. So there is no one formula and that might seem a little sort of, you know, unnerving because then what's the tolerable limit? So a study that came out of UK looked at standardized patient methodology to assess refractive error reproducibility. So patients who are standardized would be examined by different optometrists and then they found out what's the tolerable agreement limit for the subjective uh, refraction. And they came out with this number of plus minus 0.75 diopters. This might appear a little high because there are a few studies that have tabulated and within this column that you can see maybe about plus minus half a diopter. So the reason for pulling out this literature is to say that if you have a patient in your clinic and you're deciding to change their spectacles, check and see whether that is within the tolerable limit or not. Do you, do you really want to give a half a diopter um, sort of change and advise the patient to change their spectacles for just a quarter diopter or half a diopter. So the fine arts of book says DRTB, which means don't rock the boat. So if the patient is happy with their existing spectacles, even though if you're getting a different value, you still do not want to change the spectacles unless it really warrants it. The other thing about ground rules for prescribing spectacles is check and see whether the visual acuity correlates to the objective refraction. And of course, when you're doing the subjective refraction, you will have to do the duochrome as your endpoint of the monocular subjective uh, refraction. So beyond these things, we can still improve and uh, decide on what the final spectacle prescription would be by doing few other techniques. And we will go over these techniques. So the first one is dynamic retinoscopy. So what is dynamic in dynamic retinoscopy? It's actually the accommodation that becomes dynamic. 
So in a static retinoscopy, we instruct the patient to look straight and assume the accommodation is held constant. Whereas in dynamic retinoscopy, we encourage them to look at a near target. There are two methods. One is the monocular estimation method where the patient looks at an accommodative uh, stimulus, which is like a bunch of words over here, over your retinoscope. And then the examiner quickly puts in the lenses and sees, uh, measures what is the lag or the lead of accommodation. So dynamic retinoscopy essentially is measuring the accuracy of the accommodation. So MEM is one way and the other way is not method wherein the target is fixed and the examiner moves front and back. So the principle of dynamic retinoscopy is very similar to the principle of um, your retinoscopy itself, which essentially means that you're trying to make the patient's retinal point as a conjugate point to the observer's retinoscope. And the only difference between the retinoscopy and the dynamic retinoscopy is that over here we are giving the target, making the patient accommodate. And if we are doing the monocular estimation method, we would put the lens and find out what would actually neutralize a little error that we would find. Typically we find that the patients would lag, so they don't fully accommodate. So if we do the not retinoscopy method, we will have to go a little back because the patient under accommodates. So the normal value that we get on dynamic retinoscopy should be anywhere up to uh, plus 0 0.25 to plus 0.75 diopter sphere. Anything more than plus one diopter sphere, we know that that is insufficient accommodation. So we assume that children can accommodate very well when compared to adults. So that is what this graph is showing, age in years and accommodative amplitude and children seem to be having very good amplitude. But some of the children can actually behave like, you know, like presbyopia. So they may not be able to accommodate as much. And this has been shown very nicely in children with Down syndrome that has come out of UK, uh, Waterloo, Canada, and also from India. So beyond this population of uh, children with special needs, doing a dynamic retinoscopy will also help you to sometimes decide on the spectacle prescription for hyperopic children. So the point here is do not make an assumption that children can always accommodate well. Do the dynamic retinoscopy because that will help you to decide whether you want to give that hyperopic correction or not. So going on to Borish delayed subjective test. So Borish described this in his paper in American Journal of Optometry in 1945. Essentially, he described this technique for uncorrected hyperopes. So these are hyperopic patients. You find some amount of hyperopia in their objective refraction, but when you go on to do their subjective acceptance, they are not accepting that full plus. So then what do you do? So what he recommended was you do the regular subjective refraction, following which you do the negative relative accommodation procedure. So you do NRA, so you're adding the binocularly the plus lenses, and therefore you're slipping the patient into relaxing their accommodation. So once after you do the NRA, then you again instruct the patient to look back at the distance acuity chart. If they have read 2020 or six by six, then in, uh, keep the chart in the same position and you binocularly now defog the plus lenses. When you're doing binocular defogging, there are more chances that the patient will relax a lot more of their accommodation. And with this procedure, you can actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, give a plus one or plus one and a half diopter sphere much more than what you got in the subject to refraction in the first place. So if you are in a private practice and you're not able to do a cycloplegic uh, retinoscope, you can actually consider doing a borish delayed subjective test because it really brings out, uh, you know, it completely relaxes the eye and brings out the uh, full value of the hyperopic correction that you can give for your patients. We also discussed about a modified uh, technique of this, which we published uh, in uh, articles and a couple of these articles are under review now. The third thing is the binocular balancing. So in this, what we are actually balancing is accommodation and not the equity. So remember that our whole focus is on refraction and getting the clear vision. So we are playing with the accommodation and that's what we are trying to equalize and relax and make it uniform between the two eyes. So when you're balancing accommodation, you're trying to see that the accommodation in each eye is balanced. So there are different tests for doing this. One is the turbal infinity balance. You could do alternate occlusion. You could do prism dissociation. Essentially in that you would uh, fog the eye and then uh, reduce the equity by three lines. 
and you would ask for which is better. So there was a study that compared four different techniques and they found that all of these methods are comparable. Now, some of you may have your own favorite methods to do. I do the prism dissociation method and um, there are different ways in doing this also. Some people prefer putting one uh, six prism or so in front of one eye. I prefer putting uh, prisms in both the eyes so that way the patient can say, uh, when they are comparing for clarity, they are looking more at, you know, uh, comparing the two charts that they are seeing and appreciating the clarity. And they don't report a lack of clarity due to prism only in just one eye. So we are dissociating the view for the eye. So each of the eye will have its own view of the visual activity chart. We ask the patient and say which eye as a better, you know, whether the top chart is looking more clear or the bottom, and depending on their response, we would add a plus 0.25 Doppler sphere to the eye, which is having a clearer vision, because in that eye, we can relax the accommodation a bit more. So that's the idea of this. So uh, all these three different techniques we can do at the end of monocular, uh, you know, as a monocular endpoint of subjective refraction is achieved, then you could try in uh, these techniques. And, uh, we can refine this final spectacle prescription that way. And also remember that we need to have asked the patient for their binocular viewing preference when we are considering for the spectacle prescription. So in summary, what we have looked at is we saw that whether there is appropriate refractive, uh, that we, we understood that we need to have appropriate refractive correction before we jump in and do the binocular vision evaluation. And we saw that dynamic retinoscopy is actually used um, most of the times, at least in binocular vision orthoptics clinic, and the purpose for this is to know what is the accommodative accuracy. And we want to see a lag of accommodation, a small lag of accommodation in our patients. That is the expected normal. We can try the Borish delayed subjective test, and this would really help if you want to optimally correct your hyperoptic patient who in the regular subjective refraction is not able to accept more plus. And the final thing that we discussed was the binocular balancing and how do we balance accommodation. So with this, I will uh, thank you all for your attention and I will now leave it over to the moderator to take some questions. Thank you, Nandini. Thank you for a great start. And once again, highlighting the importance of clear single vision, the role of dynamic retinoscopy and stressing on the fact how important refraction is. So to everyone, we are now open for questions. We have next 10 minutes. Kindly type your question in the chat box and I will convey it to Nandini here. So Nandini, we have got a first question, which is what is modified delayed refraction? So there is a technique called modified, uh, we call it as modified optical fogging. And uh, so that is Borish delayed subjective technique. And then there is the modified Borish or modified optical fogging technique. So I'm assuming that the uh, participant is asking about the modified uh, Borish or the modified optical fogging technique. So, so, uh, sorry. sorry to interrupt. So there are two questions and the, uh, from two different people and the other person, yes, they are asking regarding the Borish delayed. Um, okay. The, they are asking regarding the modified Borish? Yes. Okay. So we can do the Borish delayed subjective test on, on the hyperopic patient for whom you are able to achieve a 2020 visual acuity. So let's say, for example, somebody is actually having plus two diopter sphere hyperopia. They walk into your clinic with complaints of headache. You are noticing that they have plus two in your retinoscope. But when you do the subjective acceptance, they are only accepting plus half a diopter sphere in order to get 2020 acuity. Okay. So in these patients, you could do the NRA, then binocular defogging, and now you will notice that they are now able to accept almost one diopter more or one and a half diopter more. So which means that after the Borish delay, they have ended up taking plus one and a half diopter or plus two diopter sphere now, and they are able to comfortably read the 2020. So this is your usual Borish. Now, in case if there is somebody who is actually having accommodative spasm, a spasm of near reflex, so for these people, you, there is no way in which we can, first of all, get these people to do a subjective refraction and get them to reach 2020, right? And therefore, even 
doing an NRA becomes a very difficult task and it's meaningless to do an NRA because their accommodation is all fluctuating all over the place. So what we do in the modified technique is we put a plus three diopter sphere. Okay, we assume what could be the NRA value. So if you're doing it at 40 centimeter, the assumption is you can relax up to plus two and a half diopter sphere. So either you could do a plus two and a half or you could put an additional plus half a diopter. So, and then have the patient read something for 30 minutes. So you are letting the patient give a feedback of a near chart wherever they are comfortable in holding it. And then you actually have them read it for 30 minutes. Post the 30 minutes, we call them and then we would do a binocular defogging. And at that point in time, you can also attempt a, doing a retinoscope and you will find that majority of that accommodative uh, stress, the fluctuation would have probably gone away. This technique doesn't work on 100% of the patients, but a majority of the patients, we can relax their accommodation if they have the spasm with this technique. Okay. Thank you, Nandini. I think you answered another person's question, which was, uh, will Borish delay helpful in accommodative spasm or ciliary spasm? Now we have another question and I, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly which normative data they are looking for, but the question is, is there any normative data for the Indian population? For children, they can refer to the band study that came out of Shankar Netralia. They were looking at the uh, uh, binocular vision uh, parameters and they gave the normative database for that for children. Um, I'm not sure of adults, uh, but the other thing, of course, is you can fall back on your Morgan's normative data. Okay. Uh, we also have a question on, is the value of uh, values of NOT and MEM retinoscopy comparable? Is the value of MEM and NOT comparable? Uh, I don't know. I can, um, I, I'm not sure if any study has looked at it specifically. They probably did. But uh, majority of the time, you know, because we are dealing with a number within your plus 0.25 to one diopter. So it's actually a very small range. So most of the times you would catch it. The only reason why these two techniques uh, uh, are used. So if I'm in the clinic and I want to do a dynamic retinoscopy, I prefer an MEM technique because it's much quicker. But if I'm going to do a study on a research mode, I would actually prefer the not retinoscopy method. And the reason for that is if I'm doing an MEM, I'm introducing a lens and therefore right away I change the accommodative status. So which is why when you're doing MEM, you have to be very quick. Whereas in not retinoscopy, you know, the patient is looking at an attractive uh, target with an accommodative stimulus. And uh, unconspicuously, the examiner can move front and back and see where the neutrality is. So there is a little bit of advantage in the not retinoscopy. Okay. And we have another question asking, how about using polarize to dissociate the eye? Uh, I, I'm, I suppose they are talking in terms of uh, balancing uh, yeah. because you are dissociating, you are uh, actually uh, uh, trying to balance the accommodation by dissociating the two eyes to give two different images. Uh, in the paper that I talked about, the four different techniques, they also use red and green and prism dissociation. Now, one of the things is um, your red green or your polarite filter is sort of also cutting down on the luminance. So as much as possible, you could use it. As I said, there are different techniques and people will have their own favorite techniques. The reason I would prefer a prism dissociation over a polaroid or a red green anaglyphs is just that we are creating a luminance level that might be artificial or, uh, and so I, I just want to see that accommodative response in a more natural viewing state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have, and I think I will take this question just because it will be helpful for a wider group of people. The question is, when do we exactly use or do cycloplegic refraction? Sorry, when do we want to do a cycloplegic refraction? Yes. Okay. Sort of a broader question, but I think a lot of people would find yes. this. No, that's a good question because many a times in a busy clinic, people actually don't do a cycloplegic refraction when it is actually warranted. In my mind, anybody who's coming in for a first time spectacle uh, prescription, you would consider doing a cycloplegic refraction if you think their visual acuity and their objective refraction is not correlating. Um, 
it is a good idea to do cycloplegic refraction on prepresbyopic patients because as the age increases the accommodative ability decreases and therefore they try to actually pump in more so there are studies that have shown that prepresbyopic patients can slip into an accommodative spasm so anyone who is having extreme eye strain and you know that they are in their prepresbyopic age group or presbyopic age group and they have never worn spectacles i would actually do it do it for them too now i am giving the indications beyond the fact that you would do a cycloplegic refraction on children okay especially when the child is coming for the first time you always do it even if the acuity correlates to the objective refraction mm -hmm. okay so children first time always a must in fact people do cycloplegic refraction on children every once a year also because you know they are emetropizing and there are a lot of changes that is going on um the other thing of course if you are getting all the varying reflex uh, that sorts of things i've had a case where uh, the, we saw a patient who was like 50 years uh, woman and she has never worn her spectacles and her distance acuity was 6 uh, 6 and her near acuity was n6 with difficulty at 50 cm so uh, they, she was only given a near near addition and then it ended up that she actually took the near addition and she felt very comfortable and started using it for distance which means that she had all that latent hyperopia which was not coming out initially and therefore uh, she had to change her spectacles two three times before we ended up doing a cycloplegic refraction and finding out she actually was a hypero and she also needed an addition on top of it so people presbyops like that could surprise you if they especially have good amplitude of accommodation always a safe idea to do cycloplegic refraction on these guys okay thank you nandini thanks for that uh, question uh, replying to that question i think a lot of people had that question here we have another question which is will borish method and cyclodemia give us the same plus oh. as cyclo refraction yeah so they are talking about cyclodemia right yes yes so i think the methods are very similar if you actually look at the literature and it's, and it's very fascinating and very interesting okay because the early literature was always about a fight between optometrists and ophthalmologists okay and uh, actually in those days ophthalmologists were very good in doing their refraction and they would come up with all different techniques so it turned out that optometrists were advertising for their practice saying that oh if you go to a medical doctor they will put drops in your eye and that's not very comfortable it will disable you and all that so we can do techniques uh, where you know we can do a better refraction and you don't need drops so it turned out cyclodemia actually was described by an ophthalmologist and they came up with the technique of uh, saying that oh we don't have to use drops because using drop is a negative advertisement for us so in the procedure of cyclodemia you're just throwing in a high plus and you're it's almost like the modified optical fogging you throw in a high plus and then you make the patient read for some time and then you so, sort of uh, deform right so i think cyclodemia and borish uh, and modified borish all of them are aiming at relaxing their accommodation so there are different ways of doing it the only difference is bo in borish it is a little more quicker because all you have to do is nra and then you're done Uh, whereas in cyclodemia and the modified optical cyclodemia by the way was again described for uh, prescribing for the hyperopes who are not relaxing whereas the modified was specifically described for people who have spasm and uh, so these techniques essentially all would uh, relax a condition i don't know if there is evidence to say how comparable these techniques are because there isn't any uh, study that has been done on that okay Thanks, Nandini. Uh, looks like I did miss one question from Manish, and of course he says, "Wonderful presentation, ma'am. What made you prefer binocular fogging over monocular? I have seen many practitioner doing monocular fogging. So your comments, Nandini? He is asking, why am I preferring binocular defogging? Binocular fogging over monocular. Yeah. So see, uh, um, in your if you are in a regular practice. being a general eye care practitioner you would that's the normal thing you would do you would do your monocular fogging you will reach the end point of subjective refraction do the diochrome all of that now we are talking about binocular vision orthoptics clinic and most of our patients come with asthenopic symptoms eye strain headache all of that okay so the binocular uh, balancing binocular uh, fogging or defogging procedures the primary aim for all of that is to make sure 
that we are relaxing the accommodation under a binocular viewing condition okay under a binocular viewing condition a person can actually accept a little more plus also because they can relax their accommodation a little bit better okay so that's why our aim is to actually relax the accommodation and at the same time have a good clear vision so we are not fogging or we are not trying to over relax or you know put a patient and reduce their activity that's not our goal we want them to have a comfortable clear single binocular vision so in the aspect of clear clarity we want to use these different techniques so yes you can use your monocular fogging but if you have these patients for whom you require a binocular vision evaluation then try these little techniques also okay so another question is modified borish delayed is only used in hypermetropia or you can use in myopia and then apply over cycloplegic sorry dr i missed out uh, can you please repeat Yeah. So this question is: Would you use modified borish uh, delayed only in hypermetropia, or you can use it in myopia and then apply or perform cycloplegic refraction? See, um, as I mentioned earlier, the modified optical fogging technique is reserved for those patients who have spasm of near reflex. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I am using it only for them. If I am getting a hyperop. or if i am getting a myopo is over corrected let's say they are wearing minus 5 diopter sphere and you are only getting a minus 3 and they are unable to relax and uh, you know they want to take that minus 5 to read 2020 in both these cases and if they are reading 2020 already and i know that this is not a, a case of a spasm but this is a case of just an over corrected myopo is not able to relax i would do the regular borish uh, delayed subjective test okay there is no need to do a modified the modified is reserved only for those who have a spasm on see patients with spasm will not read 2020 they are all over the place okay um we have one more question regarding i'll given the time what we have i'll just take one last question which was regarding what would you do if the person is sorry i'm just trying to go back and um Okay, so if the distance vision is plano and the near vision is say plus one point five spherical, and if the patient uses only reading spectacle, in due course of time he develops plus power for distance vision. Why is it so? Um, first of all, this question doesn't have the age of the patient, so it's very hard to understand mm -hmm. uh, what they are asking. But in general, we expect. in the process of hematropization and all of that we generally expect the hypopia power not to increase with age it's only the myopia that increases with age so if somebody is uncovering a hyperopia at a later time for distance all that means is you know that uh, latent hyperopia is getting manifest so in the first place before giving that plus 1 and a half diopter as a reading spectacles the the best idea is to do a cycloplegic refraction and find out is there any uh hyperopia that we need to uncover okay that will be the first thing mm -hmm. and uh, otherwise i wouldn't i wouldn't know why somebody is developing hyperopia later at a later time other than beyond explaining by the fact that you know it's their latent hyperopia that is getting manifested due yeah. to it yeah okay uh keeping with time i think nandini we will have to close the question session here we will see if we can take these question or address these question later in the day but thank you very much and uh, i am hoping everyone enjoyed this session we will go to the next session so our next speaker definitely does not require any formal introduction but uh, as all of you know he graduated from elite school of optometry and then went on to do his phd in vision science at uh, berkeley school of optometry with post doctoral training at indiana university and currently he is the scientist and director of brian holden institute of optometry and vision science at lvpi so i will ask you shrikant to get started with the talk and the next to talk is both from shrikant
Thank you, uh, Richa. I hope I am audible to everybody. The first talk that I'm going to uh, give is actually nicely dovetailing into what uh, Nandini had presented. The formal title of my talk is How do Accommodation and Virgins Interact to Achieve Clear and Single Binocular Vision? Now, the learning objectives for this session are first to describe a theoretical model uh, framework for understanding the interactions between accommodation and virgins and how they help us achieve clear and single binocular vision. The second is analyze how the achievement of clear and single binocular vision can happen in the presence of uncorrected phorias and uncorrected refractive errors. So the critical phrase in these two learning objectives is the ability to achieve clear and single binocular vision. Now I am emphasizing on the word and because it is suboptimal to achieve clear vision at the cost of diplopia, or it is equally suboptimal to get single vision at the cost of blurriness. So how does the visual system achieve both together at the same time? So let's start this out with some commonly encountered uh, clinical scenarios. Uh, the, uh, the first patient is somebody who is emetropic and who is orthophoric for distance and near. A second patient, who is a two diopter uncorrected hyperope, but he is orthophoric for again for distance and near. And a third patient who is now emetropic, but has a five prisms of XO for distance and near viewing. Now these are fairly commonly encountered scenarios in your clinical practice. And notice that between patients two and three, you could also have a combination. They could both have an uncorrected hyperope and some form of phoria but we will ignore that combination for a bit and restrict our discussion to these three scenarios. So the question as far as this talk is concerned uh, is twofold. First, is there a challenge for these patients to achieve clear and single binocular vision? If so, what is the challenge and how do we understand this in a very, very systematic manner? So towards this end, I will present to you a framework for us to understand how this uh, interaction between accommodation and virgins works and walk you through that framework and come back to these questions and try and address these questions in the context of that framework. Uh, here is the framework and, and the first shot, this might appear intimidating to, uh, to all of you. And it has terminologies that you have probably not seen or heard of before. Uh, it is my responsibility in this talk to walk you guys through this framework. And honestly, it is not as intimidating as it looks. Now, from a classification of uh, accommodation and virgins point of view, we all know the Maddox classification, the four classifications of uh, blur driven, virgins driven proximity and tonic accommodation. Um, in, the, in this particular framework, we will only talk about the blur and the virgins driven accommodation uh, and virgins. We will ignore the, fa the existence of proximity and tonic accommodation for the most part in this uh, talk. So the first of uh, the components in this framework is the top half of this uh, model where, the, where we are going to talk about blur driven accommodation. So as we all know, blur is the primary stimulus to an accommodative response. The fact that an image appears defocused on your retina is a trigger factor for the visual system to now say, how do I take care of this blur and reinstate clear vision? This is done using two components in the uh, visual system. One is called the phasic accommodation controller and second is the tonic accommodation controller. Um, and the information is processed in these two controllers and the output of these uh, parts of the uh, processing is sent to the accommodative system, essentially your ciliary muscle and your crystalline lens and an accommodative response is produced. Now this accommodative response is not happen immediately. It takes a little bit of time for the accommodative response to happen. It typically takes about a second or so for the response to be completed. During that time, the entire system works in the form of a feedback driven system. So the output of accommodation is essentially sent back to the brain for processing to say how much more or do I have to accommodate in order to achieve clear vision. This process of feedback loop continues on and on until the time clear vision is restored in your retina. Think of this feedback system very simply as the air conditioners in your house. So 
where it's very hot outside these days and you want to turn on your air conditioners to reduce the temperature of the room. Now, how does this air conditioner work? It senses what the outside temperature is. It looks at what the, what the expected temperature for me is. For instance, if the outside temperature is 35 degrees and you have set it to be about 20 degrees, 15 degrees is the difference between the outside temperature and my desired temperature. Now that is essentially the stimulus for the air conditioner to start working. Um, and it continues to pro, uh, put pump in clear, uh, pump in uh, cool air into your room and through a feedback mechanism. And when the desired temperature is reached, then the, uh, the feedback system essentially says, well, you have reached the desired temperature and I'm going to cut you off. That's when the thermostat sort of stops working. Now, if you are very evil and you decide to open the window in the house, hot air again gushes in. The, uh, the temperature, desired temperature is no longer maintained at 20 degrees and that will restart the air conditioner to again start functioning. The accommodation functions in an extremely similar way if you think about it. There is blur on the retina, which is the, uh, which is the current state of affairs, the outside temperature and the the difference between the outside temperature and the desired temperature, in this case, the blurriness versus the clear vision, that is processed by the brain and the output is produced in the form of a feedback system. The, the process continues on until clear vision is restored in the retina. So that's how the accommodative system typically functions and tries to get clear vision. The exact same thing now happens for the virgin system as well where now disparity or double vision is the primary stimulus for the virgin's response. So the sense of double vision or disparity is processed by these two systems in your brain, the phasic virgin's controller and tonic virgin's controller, and it produces an output to the virgin's plant. In, in this case, it's the extraocular muscles, and the eye starts converging or diverging. This process, again, doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes about, again, a second or so to complete. During this process, there is a feedback-driven system that continues to make the eyes converge or diverge um, until you get single vision. Now, in case you are wondering what these two terminologies are, the phasic and tonic accommodation controllers and virgins controllers, think of these as cells in your uh, midbrain that are specialized for processing information related to blur or disparity. So it is the activity of these cells that essentially get sent to the crystalline lens or ciliary muscle and the extraocular muscles to produce the desired responses. So both these systems, the accommodative system and the virgin system function as an independent feedback driven systems. Now, as long as these two systems are working independent of each other, each one will do its own job of achieving clear vision and achieving single vision. And I don't really need to be giving this talk anymore to you guys. Unfortunately or fortunately, our visual system doesn't work that way. Our accommodative and virgin systems are not independent of each other, but they are connected to each other to, through crosslinks. So the two crosslinks are your accommodative convergence crosslink, AC crosslink, uh, that produces some amount of convergence every time you accommodate. And you have the CA crosslink that produces a given amount of accommodation every time you converge. So let's focus on the AC for a minute. The accommodative convergence is the ability of the blur driven system to generate a virgins response uh, for every diopter of accommodation, how much of virgins am I producing? So the strength is determined by the magnitude of virgins that is produced for a given diopter of accommodation. The units for the ACA ratio, and for those of you who took the pre-quiz, this was a question in there. The units for the ACA ratio, the numerator will be in units of convergence, that is prism diopters, and the denominator will be in units of uh, accommodation, which is in diopters. So, now, for those, if, logically speaking, if accommodation is able to produce a given amount of virgins, disparity is also able to produce a given amount of virgins, the total virgins response that is produced as shown here is the sum of both of these elements. If I now therefore have to isolate how much is accommodation giving me the virgins response independent of disparity, logically I have to take this disparity guy out of the equation. 
it is fairly common sense logic. If two people are doing an activity together, and if I want to assess the contribution of one person to that activity, all I have to do is ask the other person to leave the room and then assess his contribution. So my ability to get rid of disparity when I am measuring the accommodations contribution to virgins is relatively easy. All I have to do is, is close one eye and my disparity essentially is meaningless anymore and I can measure the amount of accommodative convergence. Therefore, if you recall in your measurements of ACA ratios, you always use four years to measure the ACA ratio. You cover one eye or the other using an alternate cover test and that eliminates disparity for you and allows you to measure the contribution of the accommodative convergence component. The other cross-link is also equally important, although we seldom measure this in the clinic. The convergence accommodation cross-link, much like the AC, is a measure of how much convergence can drive accommodation. One prism diopter of convergence can produce how many diopters of accommodation is a measure of the CAC ratio. The units, therefore, are opposite of the ACA ratio. The numerator is in diopters, and the denominator is in prism diopters. Now, if you use the same logic that we set up earlier for measuring the ACA ratio, if I have to measure the CAC ratio, then I practically will have to remove the blur's contribution to the total accommodative response. Now, it turns out that my ability to do that is very difficult. It's not that very straightforward at all, especially in a clinical scenario. In a research laboratory setting, we have other techniques for removing the blur's contribution, but in a clinic, it is that it's not very easy. And therefore, we do not measure the CAC ratio very much at all in the clinic. But I do want to emphasize that as much as AC component is important in driving this entire response, the CA is also equally important uh, in, in producing clear and single binocular vision. All right, now that we have set up this framework and hopefully you are all in sync with me as far as how this framework is working, let's go back to some of the examples that we started out earlier. In real world, if you think about it, this entire framework is happening dynamically. Every time you change fixation from one distance to another, there is both blur and disparity that happens at the same time. The blur will stimulate your accommodative process, disparity will stimulate the virgin's process, blur will also stimulate virgins through the AC, disparity will also stimulate accommodation through CA. So essentially all four elements of this framework are constantly sort of working in tandem with each other. This is really where the fundamental challenge as far as achieving clear and single binocular vision is concerned. So the first patient that came to our clinic, the emetrope and the orthophoric guy, is the most ideal scenario that you can think of. This individual, the accommodative demand and the virgin's demand in this individual are, are similar to each other, are the same, and therefore the two systems are in harmony with each other. Now, if I go to the next patient, your uncorrected hyperope, and who is orthophoric for distance and near, the uncorrected hyperope, the two diopter uncorrected hyperope has an extra load on the accommodative system. For instance, when this individual changes viewing distance from a distant target to say 40 centimeters, he has to accommodate for that viewing distance of about two and a half diopters, and also has to compensate the two diopters of uncorrected hyperopia. So in, in theory, this individual has about four and a half diopters of accommodative demand, whereas there is no increase in the virgin's demand beyond what is dictated by the viewing distance. So in this system, if the person decides to accommodate the entire four and a half diopters, he will produce clear vision through the feedback system, but there will be too much convergence that will come through from the AC crosslink. That will make the eye now go into an ESO-deviated ESO position. So here is a scenario where this patient is likely to achieve clear vision, but at the cost of diplopia. That's not an optimal scenario as we had discussed earlier. Let's take the third scenario where the patient is now emetropic, but now has five prism diopters of uh, phoria for distance and near. The reverse challenge happens in this individual. The disparity system now faces the extra load of virgins beyond the viewing distance. This guy also has to now converge for that extra phoria that is there. 
he will achieve single vision but at the same time there is now going to be an extra load on the accommodative system through the ca crosslink so this individual may achieve single vision but at the cost of blurriness so in both these scenarios patient 2 and patient 3 we saw how there is a disharmony between the accommodation and virgins that sets in and it is easy to achieve either clear vision or single vision but at the cost of the other system so let's for a minute look at what is the source of this hyperopia and the phoria for us to understand this scenario a little bit better source of hyperopia is fairly straightforward and it could it could be uh, because of a smaller axial length it could be an underpowered eye uh, and it's not that uh, difficult to imagine where the hyperopia came from however the the phoria that has come into this individual is a little bit more non intuitive especially for the near viewing distance so let us let's spend a little bit of time trying to understand what this where this phoria at near came from now recall what i said earlier that when a person is looking at a near target in this framework the amount of virgins that is produced is contributed both by disparity and also by the accommodative convergence so the ac the cross link or the aca ratio of that individual plays a very very important role in deciding how much convergence should be produced at near now in an ideal scenario the entire convergence demand can be met by the accommodative process essentially met by the aca ratio it's almost like hitting two birds in one stone where the single stone that you are throwing is the effort to accommodate and the two birds that you are hitting is one the one the accommodative response that produces clear vision and the virgins response through the ac cross link that produces single vision as well so the ideal aca ratio of an individual will always be equal to the ipd of an of uh, the person now in case you are wondering where that connection came from let's go through an example here that will illustrate this process so assume that the person's I, um, ipd is uh, 60 mm or 6 cm and the person is viewing a target at 40 cm viewing distance so the virgin's demand dictated by the viewing distance is a product of the interpupillary distance and the reciprocal of the viewing distance so uh, 6 cm times 2 and 1/2 uh, meter angles that produces 15 prism diopters of convergence so if this entire 15 prism diopters of convergence has to be produced by accommodation then 15 prism diopters divided by 2 and 1/2 diopters of accommodation that is dictated by 40 cm gives you an aca ratio of 6 prism diopters is to 1 notice that 6 pd is equal to the ipd of that individual you do whatever combinations of ipd whatever combinations of viewing distance you will end up recreating the ipd of that individual to be the ideal aca ratio of that person so ideally if the entire virgin's demand has to be met by accommodation the aca ratio should equal the ipd of that individual now here is data that is shown here for what is the actual ipd of this individual is the actual aca ratio of this individuals so, when i do measure this in in a vast number of individuals this is old data from ogle and martens but uh, there is newer data that supports these values more or less to be the same the population average aca ratio that is measured is approximately about 4 prism diopters is to 1 or to be exact 3.6 prism diopters is to 1 now ideally i should have an aca ratio of 6 prism diopters is to 1 producing 15 prism diopters of convergence whereas what i am able to produce with my accommodation is only about 10 prism diopters 4 times 2.5 meter angles gives you about 10 prism diopters of convergence so the deficiency in the virgin's response is that 5 prism diopters and it's that 5 prism diopters that manifests as the near exophoria in this individual and as you all know this 5 prism diopters now has to be compensated by the positive fusional virgins so the aca ratio in general contributes to only about uh, 65% to the total near virgins response the remaining 35% has to be met by the fusional virgin system the residual virgins that manifests as a near exophoria has to be corrected by positive fusional virgins in this graph i have essentially divided 
the uh, population average ACA ratio into three components. A, a person with an ideal ACA ratio, assuming six centimeter IPD, will manifest orthophoria for near. The entire virgin's demand is met by accommodation. A person, the vast majority of us who have lower than normal ACA ratios, lower than ideal ACA ratios, will invariably manifest with an exo deviation at near that needs to be corrected by positive fusional virgins. And the small number of us who have a ACA ratio greater than the ideal will manifest as ESO deviations and has to be corrected by the negative fusional virgins. So in this context, if you come back to these two patients, this uncorrected hyperope that produces extra demand on accommodation will have a challenge if the ACA ratio is close to ideal or higher than ideal. The most obvious scenario, clinical scenario that you will encounter is that of an accommodative esotrope. A child who more or less shows orthophoria for distance but shows a big fat esotropia when it comes to near viewing. That's because their ACA ratio is very high and on top of it, there is also an hyperopia that this child now has to accommodate to and get rid of. Uh, the vast majority of us will have lower ACA ratios and we will end up manifesting as the five prisms of EXO that is seen in the third patient. So the bigger question for us is while we have set up this challenge that there can be disharmony between accommodation and virgins, really the question is, is the visual system capable of managing this challenge? Vast majority of us experience this challenge. Most of us are not hematropic. Most of us are not orthophoric for distance in near. We do have a reasonable amount of uh, phorias, and yet majority of us don't run into an orthoptics clinic seeking uh, support. So how do we manage it? And why do those unfortunate patients who cannot manage it come to the clinic? Clinically, we do measure this ability to manage the conflict and we do so using two uh, methods. One is the positive relative accommodation and negative relative accommodation from the accommodation direction. And in the virgins direction, we do this as positive and negative fusional virgins. So please recall the techniques for these uh, uh, measures. For positive and negative relative accommodation, you make the person look at a target at a constant viewing distance. And then you put negative lenses to stimulate accommodation for PRA and you put positive lenses to relax accommodation for NRA. What are you really doing? You're keeping the virgin stimulus fixed and you are changing the accommodative stimulus using positive and negative lenses. Essentially, you are creating an hyperopia or myopia in that individual and seeing how well can they manage in the context of the framework that we described earlier. Turns out we do have an ability to manage that conflict. It is in the order of about plus or minus two, two and a half diopters. Uh, these values are similar to what uh, Rizwana and her colleagues had published a few years ago in the band study. Um, for virgins, we do the same thing. We do positive and negative fusional virgins measurements by putting prisms in front of the eye. Once again, we make the person keep the target clear, essentially keep accommodation constant at the one viewing distance and we change virgins by putting in uh, base out and base in prisms. And you usually record this as blur break and recovery values. And the values here are uh, similar to what has been published earlier as well. So the bottom line point is our visual system does have the ability to manage this conflict to some extent. But if the disharmony between accommodation and virgins goes beyond a certain level, then obviously the patients do experience esthenopic symptoms and they come to you as optometrists for uh, support. So in summary, the accommodation and virgin systems do not function independently and they are linked to each other at a neural level. Um, second is the ACA and CAC ratios measure the strength of the crosslink between these two uh, systems. The near phoria, as we saw earlier, is because of the ACA ratio not being equal to the ideal ACA ratio. You have exophoria or exodeviation when your ACA ratio is lesser than the ideal and you have an uh, esodeviation when you have the ACA ratio larger than the ideal ACA. Phorias and uncorrected hyperopias do create disharmony in the interaction between accommodation and virgins and our visual system does have the capability to manage these conflicts to some extent. We measure this in our orthoptic evaluation as NRA, PRA and NFV and PFV values. So, 
So I hope this talk uh, made uh, you appreciate the importance of a theoretical framework to understand how clear and single vision is achieved and how this framework can be used to understand scenarios that are fairly commonly encountered in a clinical setup. So with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and I hand it back to the moderator for uh, questions. Thank you, Srikant, and uh, very nicely done. I think for uh, probably some of the people who are here, this would have been the first time they are seeing uh, Shor's model where you have shown accommodation and virgins interaction. Um, we are open to questions now. I would uh, invite the participants to type in their questions. Thank you, Nandini. I'll wait to hear from you. There aren't... Okay, I think people are still thinking and maybe mulling over things. While we wait on people to type questions, um, I would like to ask you a question, Srikant. Yeah. So I think as a clinician, most of the time we think of ACA only when we think about, you know, uh, the, the very first example that pops into everybody's mind is accommodative esophobia. Correct. So for children, we say, oh, we need to give the executive bifocal because they have a high ACA. Right. Are, there, are there any thoughts you want to sort of elaborate on what, uh, you know, what's the basic science or the, with your model, what is it that we need to be uh, looking at? So the, uh, th thanks for that question, Nandini. I, I go back to this uh, case uh, of uh, the second patient that we uh, discussed here, the uncorrected hyperope. Now, in the uncorrected hyperope, if you notice in the framework that I presented, there is the extra blur that is there in the system that this uncorrected hyperope has to handle. And if it is a patient who has an uncorrected hyperopia plus an high ACA ratio, you're referred to accommodative esotropes, then there is a double whammy for these people. They no longer has to overcome the blurriness with extra accommodation, but they are also against getting single vision using your ACA uh, ratio. So, so this is really what manifests as an accommodative esotropia in most of these children. Now, I'm not in the clinic for me to provide a clinical uh, wisdom on this, but from my laboratory experience, I can tell you that uh, some patients are very, very, uh, uh, very interesting. They end up adopting strategies that will allow them to prevent this esotropia from showing up. We had a child in the lab uh, several years ago, about a three, four year old child. And we are trying to get this child to accommodate by showing a, uh, a cartoon movie. And absolutely nothing comes out of this child as far as an accommodation is concerned. There is practically zero accommodation that's happening out of this child. Now in parallel, the mother of the child has uh, told some of our clinical optometrists that I occasionally see an inward pointing item in this uh, child, but I'm not able to uh, really pinpoint when it happens or how often it happens and stuff. Uh, some of the optometrists who examined this child also did not uh, pick on this, but the fact that, the, so we were trying to put these two things together and when we forced the child to accommodate by making the child read some near targets, uh, you know, uh, little optotypes and stuff, the child is reading, the accommodation is happening in that child and comes along with that accommodation is that big fat isotropia. So the strategy this child has taken in order to prevent the ESO from happening is to prevent, is to stop accommodating. So the child's been living in a rather blurry environment in order to prevent diplopia from happening. So this to me is a very interesting conscious strategy that the child has adopted in order to uh, prevent the diplopia from showing up and, and the compromise that the child has made is to the uh, clear vision that is possible. This is why I was saying earlier, neither of this is an optimal scenario. So yeah, so that's one, that's one thought that I have. Oh, that's a very interesting, uh, you know, like a, uh, your experimental or your laboratory wisdom that you're giving us. So from what you said, it appears that uh, somebody would compromise the clarity of the vision in order to maintain single vision, right? Yes. So we're talking about clear single vision. And if somebody is put in a spot where somebody has to... Uh, you know, uh, compromise between one or the other. And your example is saying that they compromised on clarity. Is this the normal? Do you know of any research that has 
sort of uh, say yeah it, it tends to be uh, nandini that uh, that uh, between the two systems between uh, my experience of blurriness and my experience of diplopia diplopia tends to be more debilitating than uh, blurriness is and uh, now for instance i am uh, uh, my glasses that i am wearing may not be the perfect uh, refractive correction for me i may have a small amount of uncorrected uh, refractive error and the blurriness that it produces doesn't really bother me but if i even experience a small amount of uh, double vision i am going to come running into the clinic to try and fix it so there is a lot of basic science reason why one is more tolerant to uh, to blurriness than to diplopia but because of our tolerance to the blurriness we tend to uh, adopt strategies where single vision is maintained but at the cost of blurriness having said that i think this is also maybe the clinical connect to this is every time we see a patient in the clinic who is not producing an accommodative response as expected big lags of accommodation and stuff maybe there is a, a strategy like this that these patients are are following so it may be worthwhile to push them to accommodate and see what happens to their four year status okay so it looks um, like yeah sorry sorry to interrupt guys looks like the chat window uh, was disabled hence there are few people messaging me that they are not able to type in in the common window so if you can just give couple of minutes sure, sure. okay while we are waiting on uh, the chat box to open up shrikant you mentioned that we don't measure cac ratio correct uh, in the clinic but if we have to are there ways in which we can do it yes there are ways to uh, to do it the logic for doing this is to uh, essentially like i said in again in this model is to take blur out of the equation now there are two ways of taking blur out of the equation one is uh, by putting in a small pin hole in front of the eye that essentially makes the depth of focus very very large and you can uh, remove blur uh, that way so the world appears clear to the person um, uh, all through uh, that's one way of doing this the second is the exact opposite of it is to give a target that is so blurred that the blur system doesn't really recognize that there is any change in the blur that's happening so there are these are experimental techniques that uh, that, that we can adopt and uh, it tends to uh, you you can measure the cac ratio that way but in the clinic it's not really straight it's not really straight forward unfortunately thank you actually after we opened the chat box there were many questions actually asking about the cac ratio so i think i have right. okay for uh, quite a bit of people there was one question that says what effect does ca cac ratio have on measures of fusional vertices right so the cac ratio is the byproduct of fusional vertices if you think about it so for instance if i can go back to this model again the bottom part of that model that i am now moving my cursor over that is the fusional vertices system so you can see that the cac ratio is typically the byproduct of the fusional vergence so the more i fuse or the more i exercise my fusional vergence the more blur that i the more accommodation that i am going to produce through the cac cross link the way it will manifest is and and this is not yet uh, you know uh, through evidence that i am saying but it is through preliminary data from uh, from my lab uh the blur in the blur break recovery findings that you do in your uh, fusional vergence testing the blur that you experience in your fusional vergence testing could very well be the output of the cac ratio so as you put prisms in front of the eye and make the person converge there is an increase in accommodation that keeps on happening through the cac cross link up now that is going to produce an undesired accommodation that will eventually start manifesting as blur so i would reverse that question a little bit and say it is not so much about what influence cac has on fusional vergence but it's the other way around what influence does fusional vergence have on the cac ratio and on accommodation there is one question from the audience that says uh, you have shown your slide we don't have blur point for distance in the negative fusional vergence and why Correct. is that? 
Right. So uh, it's a good, it's a good uh, question. So uh, notice what do we do again? Recall what do we do in negative fusion divergence testing? We put base in prisms in order to make the eye diverge uh, to look at a target. So let's go back to this model and say what will happen when you now put a uh, base in prism. So a base in prism produces a disparity that will now initiate the system to diverge the eye now, when there is a divergence response that is happening, the CA will also now signal a reduction in accommodation. So if convergence will signal an increase in accommodation, divergence will signal a decrease in accommodation. This decrease in accommodation will manifest itself as a reduction in the accommodative response. So now notice this here. If you are looking at a distant target and there has to be a reduction in the accommodation, there's got to be some accommodation that is left over for that to be relaxed. If the accommodation is already perfectly relaxed, there is no question of blur being experienced in that case. So that's why if your refraction has been correct and if all of your latent hyperopia has been taken care of, then whatever in the base invergence testing, negative fusional virgins testing, you are not expected to see a blur um, for distance. At near, you will, because there is some amount of accommodation to relax. But for distance, you do not. In fact, the clinical wisdom is if you do notice a blur point for distance NFV testing, then you go back to your refraction and, and, and double check it to see if there is more hyperopia that can be, that can be relaxed. Right. Uh, we probably can take a couple more questions. The next talk is yours, Shrikan, so I'm sort of going to cut into that talk time a little bit because there are questions. Sure. Sure. Uh, one uh, question is, which is a better method to measure the ACA ratio? Is it gradient or heterophoria? Um, yeah, so the, uh, the, the logic behind both these techniques are more or less the same in the sense that you want to stimulate an accommodation and you want to measure the resultant change in foria. Now, how do you stimulate accommodation is, is what matters. In the uh, gradient technique, you stimulate accommodation by change in viewing distance. You have you measure the foria for distance and then you measure the foria for a near viewing again. And the change in the foria is what you call as the ACA uh, ratio. In the heterophoria technique or the calculated technique, you maintain the viewing distance the same, but you induce accommodation by putting negative lenses, minus two diopters or minus three diopters. So the difference between the two is in the gradient technique, in addition to blur driven accommodation, you also have proximal accommodation that will kick in. That will increase your ACA ratio, increase your accommodative uh, component a little bit, consequently having an impact on the ACA ratio. Whereas in the heterophoria technique, you do not have the proximal accommodation kicking. So my take on this is I don't think there is one technique that is correct and the other is wrong. If you are looking for a technique that is more of a real world technique, then I would go with the gradient one because that's what you do in day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, you know, activities. But if you, are, if you want to isolate only the blur component and measure it, I would go with the heterophoria technique. Okay, probably the last question, I'll just take this. And uh, this is actually from Preeta. She, she would like to hear from you regarding uh, the blur and the break and which systems would contribute for this. And she also had a question on what's the role of ton tonic accommodation and virgins. Right. The tonic accommodation and virgins, I will, I will reserve it to the next talk because we are going to talk um, a, a reasonable amount about that. Um, with respect to the blur break and, and recovery, uh, let me walk you through that scenario. And, and this is something that, uh, again, I'm telling you this is not necessarily published, but this is the current thinking on it. Uh, so you're doing positive fusional virgins testing. You put on a base out prism in front of the eye while the person is looking at a target uh, constantly at a given viewing distance. So blur stimulus is constant or, or accommodative demand is constant. Virgence is changing by changing the uh, prism in front of the eye. So the minute you put a prism, that's going to stimulate these two active regions in the brain, your phasic and the tonic systems. So it will produce a certain amount of virgence response. Now, because these are getting stimulated, the fusional system is getting stimulated, you also are going to stimulate the convergence accommodation crosslink, and that's going to produce a small amount of accommodative response. 
Now, as you keep increasing the amount of prism that is there, the virgins will keep increasing to maintain single vision. And at the same time, accommodation will also keep increasing uh, courtesy the CAC ratio. At one point of time, the amount of accommodation that is produced will hit the depth of focus threshold, which means that you have reached a point where the system, the blur that is produced is no longer within your tolerable limit. That's when we think you start experiencing blur. And as you increase the prism in front of the eye, more and more convergence is going to happen, more and more blur is experienced. And at one point, you have reached the upper limit of how much you can converge. That represents the recover, uh, That represents the break in your system. And at that point, you now slowly start reducing the amount of prisms. And you find out when single vision is restored. And that's a measure of the tonic uh, virgins controller. So this, is, this thought process is somewhat contradictory to what is currently available in the literature that blur is experienced because extra accommodation is being kicked in in order to help the virgin system. I personally don't believe in that for, for a variety of reasons that uh, I can discuss offline with you. But my belief is that the system is a convergence accommodation driven system and blur is experienced because of the accommodation reaching the depth of focus threshold. I hope yeah. that answers your question, Preeta. Yeah, yeah, uh, Srikant, thank you. We are definitely uh, stretching a bit into your next talk. So hopefully you will cut down the time yourself yes. <laughs> and try to keep it to time. And this session will be moderated by Vidisha. Uh, there are, while you're setting up the next talk, Srikant, I'll just say yeah. that there are people who are asking uh, questions to repeat and all of that. We are recording this session. So this will be available for you at a later time also. Over to you, Srikant, for the next talk, which is all right. on the Korea loan in binocular vision. Yes, so I am just going to load that. Okay, um, all right, guys. We will we will continue our discussion on all the aspects that we that we spoke about, and this time we will specifically focus on uh, the concept of uh, the heterophorias that we set out last time, and how do they define a load on the binocularity, and what does that all mean to the, uh, the non strabismic Smith BV disorders. Uh, so the learning objectives from this session are one uh, is to define what the distance and near heterophoria is in the context of tonic virgins and the ACA ratio. And second, illustrate a, a supply demand relationship between heterophoria and fusional virgins. So, uh, like it's mentioned here, the talk is intended to set the tone for our understanding of non strabismic PV disorder. So whatever Vidisha is going to talk next, there is some element of what we are going to discuss today that can be applied in her talk for our better understanding of the problem. Right, so we start with the Maddox classification. Like I said in my earlier talk, Maddox classified the accommodation and virgin system into four components, blur, tonic, virgins, and proximal, uh, similar for the uh, horizontal virgin system as disparity virgins, tonic, accommodative, and proximal. In this talk, we will primarily focus on the tonic virgins and tonic accommodation component and how they define your four years and so on and so forth. A quick recall of the previous uh, talk, we said blur is the primary stimulus for accommodation, works as a feedback loop, uh, and disparity is the primary stimulus for your virgin system, and this too works as an independent feedback loop. We in all of what we discussed last time, we primarily focused on the phasic accommodation and the phasic virgins controller. This controller is primarily, or this set of neurons in the brain, is primarily responsible for immediately removing a blur input or a disparity input. When I say immediate, I am talking in time scales of about a few hundred milliseconds to one second. And it is these two cells or neurons that essentially also drive the cross link between accommodation and convergence. In this particular talk, we will focus on the tonic accommodation and tonic virgins controller, and we'll try and see how they influence our measures of four years and fusional virgins. So the tonic accommodation or virgins, as is classically described, is the resting state of the ciliary muscle 
uh, or extracular muscles in the absence of any stimulus. So, uh, one example of an absence of a stimulus is when you are in complete darkness. There is nothing that is there for you to accommodate to or for you to converge to. Or say, this is my favorite example, although my colleagues will make fun of me, is when you are traveling in an airplane and the airplane is going through cloud. And there is really nothing that you are seeing through that uh, through the window of yours and there is nothing that you have to accommodate or converge to and that's another scenario where you are uh, looking at a resting state of accommodation and virgin so a common mistake that uh, people make is uh, they measure they say resting states of accommodation and virgins is when you are looking at a distant target Unfortunately, that is not correct because at distant target, there is still a stimulus to accommodation and virgins. The stimulus may be zero diopters or zero meter angles, but nevertheless, there is a stimulus and you do have a, uh, you do have a defined accommodation or a virgins demand. Whereas in the resting state, there is absolutely no stimulus at all. And typically, the resting states of accommodation and virgins is typically around arm's length from us, about one and a half diopters. So, now, in order to understand the resting state, let's take a step back and look at what are the positions of rest that can exist in the system. There are two positions of rest. One is called the anatomical position of rest and second is the physiological position of rest. The anatomical position of rest is when you are dead and that's not of concern to us presently. What we are concerned is about the physiological position of rest. And that physiological position of rest is when there is an inherent tonicity to the extracular muscle. The fact that you are alive, live and kicking means that the, your muscles do have an inherent tonicity and that measure of inherent tonicity is your physiological position of rest. Now in this context, the difference between the person, the difference between the resting state of the eye or the physiological position of rest and, and, and where the eye should be viewed is a measure of the phoria of the person. Now, let's look at distance phoria for a minute. When you're looking at a target at optical infinity or when you're looking at distance, the two eyes have to be sort of parallel to each other. And what is the physiological position of rest with respect to this parallel position? If the physiological position of rest is equal to the parallel viewing, in other words, if the tonicity of the extracular muscles are equal to parallel viewing, then your eye is appropriately converged for that viewing distance. And this position is what we will call as an orthophoria position. If the muscle tonicity or the physiological position of rest is larger, is greater than what is required for parallel viewing, you will end up seeing the eyes to be a little bit more converged and that's what you are going to call as an esophoria. Now notice in the uh, your alternate cover test or your cover and cover test, the eye within the occluder as is shown here assumes an inward pointed direction and the minute you open the occluder, the eye flies out in order to achieve straight vision. So the fact that the eye is moving from inwards to outwards indicates that its resting position is inwards and can be interpreted as arising from the muscle tonicity to be greater than what is required for parallel viewing. Exophoria is the opposite scenario where the muscle tonicity is lesser than what you require for parallel viewing. So the eyes appear slightly diverged in the resting state. Again, in your alternate cover test, when you put the occluder in front of one eye, the eye does appear to be outward pointed out. When you remove the occluder, the eye will come back to a straight ahead position. Now notice that in these examples, just for illustration sake, I have covered only the right eye. You could do exactly the same thing to the left eye as well and you will get a similar kind of a response. So essentially emphasizing on the fact that phoria measurements are binocular measurements and you can't define phoria of the left eye and phoria of the right eye separately. They are the two eyes combined position is a measure of the phoria status of the eye. Near phoria, on the other hand, as we saw um, in a little bit of uh, detail, is defined by the patient's ACA ratio. Now, the measured ACA ratio, if it is lesser than the ideal ACA ratio, you end up getting exophoria. Vast majority of us have that. If you are measured equals the ideal, you are in an orthophoric position for near. If your measured is greater than the ideal, you end up going into an esodeviated state. Now, when you do measure 
the four years for distance and near. And this is what you end up finding. The graph that is shown here is a frequency histogram of the measured four years for distance viewing and for near viewing. Notice that distance four years for a vast majority of us, in fact, 70% of us in this study, again by Ogle, uh, is about only one prism of EXO. The range is anywhere between north of four years to two prisms of EXO, whereas the near four years is more in the order of about three to five prisms of EXO. The fact that you most of us maintain an orthophoric position for distance indicates that the resting position, the physiological state of rest is in some way getting adapted for us to achieve parallel viewing. And this process has been termed as your orthophorization. Now, in this context, I want to sort of compare orthophorization to an emetropization mechanism where that may be a more familiar term to you than orthophorization is. Emetropization indicates the eyeball to change its biometric parameters, axial length, corneal curvature, lens thickness, and so on and so forth, in order to achieve emetropic refraction. Orthophorization is a process where the resting positions of the eye, the phoria, the physiological states of rest, the tonicity of the muscles, they are all getting adjusted in order for me to achieve uh, orthophoric uh, phoria for distant viewing. So these two systems, both of them indicate physiological adaptation mechanisms that happen over a reasonably long periods of time, so over several months or several years. At near, the view, the scenario is a little bit more complicated, and we see that there is a phoria that is now there for near viewing. Now, how do we understand this a little bit more systematically? So let's go back to some illustrative examples of how do we calculate the virgin's demand at a near viewing distance. So as is indicated in the slide here, the virgin's demand is primarily dictated by three parameters. So it is dictated by the viewing distance, the interpupillary distance, and the heterophoria. Viewing distance is relatively obvious. The more closer you get a target, the more convergence that I have to produce, the more virgins demand that is there. So viewing distance per se is inversely proportional to the virgins demand. The interpupillary distance is directly proportional to the virgins demand. Uh, the, the favorite example that I always like to give is compare the IPD of a young baby, about 45 millimeters of IPD to that of a hammerhead shark, very, very wide IPD. For the two entities to see a target at a constant viewing distance, the child now has to converge very little to look at the target because the two eyes are very close to each other. Whereas a hammerhead shark has to now rotate quite a bit to look at the target because the IPD is very, very wide. So wider the IPD, you have a greater demand on the virgin system. So the heterophoria is the third component that's going to add to the virgin's demand in addition to whatever the uh, IPD and the viewing distance is dictating. Let's get some examples of the first two parameters and then let's go to the heterophoria example. Here is one. The viewing distance is 40 centimeters. IPD of the individual is 6 centimeters. And you can do the math and you will get the virgin's demand to be about 15 percent diopters of convergence. Now, as I increase the viewing distance to 20 centimeters, or rather as I decrease the viewing distance to 20 centimeters, my virgin's demand has now gone from 15 prism diopters to about 30 prism diopters. So halving of the viewing distance essentially doubled my virgin's demand. Notice IPD is the same. I go back to my 40 centimeter viewing distance, but I now have a seven centimeter IPD instead of a six centimeter and that increased my virgin's demand to 17.5 prism diopters, a two and a half prism diopters for a centimeter increase in my IPD. So between the two parameters, viewing distance obviously is the one that defines the uh, virgin's demand more than the IPD, but you can't really ignore the impact of IPD on the virgin's demand either. That's the take home message on this. Now, if I add heterophoria to the mix, Let's see what happens. The viewing distance now is 40, IPD is 6 centimeters. Now I add the person having a 5 prism diopters of exophoria. Now this individual, in addition to the 15 prism diopters that was defined by the IPD and the viewing distance, now also has another 5 prism diopters that this individual has to converge, making the total demand to about 20 prism diopters. Essentially, reiterating the fact that exophoria will increase the demand on the fusional convergence system. If I have five prisms of esophoria, 
the virgin's demand is now reduced to 10% diopters uh, and esophoria increases the demand on the fusional divergence system. So the phorias essentially change the virgin's demand in addition to what is dictated by the IPD and the viewing distance. Now in this context, now we have set up what the phoria is and what kind of demand it imposes on the system and the fusional virgins as the mechanism that is meant to overcome the, the, uh, the demand. Let's think about this in the context of uh, the supply demand relationship. Uh, let's take economics for a minute uh, where the x-axis on this parameter is the quantity that uh, of, of an uh, parameter that is there and the y is the price. Again, the example of that in the current context would be the masks that all of you are wearing for the COVID situation. Prior to the COVID-19 epidemic, none of you even cared about using masks uh, and the quantity requirement of that masks was very, very little, was very, very little. So the demand on the masks was very little and the price per mask was therefore also very, very low. Now with the unfortunate epidemic that we are all in the middle of, the demand for the masks have increased and the supply has not increased as much and therefore the cost price of the mask has increased tremendously. So essentially the take home message on this is as the demand basically keeps increasing, it will eat and if the supply is not proportionately increasing, the load on the system is going to increase. Another straightforward household example, if your income is X uh, rupees and if your expenditure is lesser than that X rupees, you are, you are still in a safe zone. But if your expenditure is now 2x of the amount that you're earning, you're really in trouble. So it is in this context that you want to think about the phoria versus the fusional virgins uh, demand and supply relationship as well. So think of the uh, phoria as the demand on the virgin system. And the supply that is available to take care of the demand is the fusional virgin system. As long as the supply is greater than the demand, you are in a surplus and you don't have a problem. But when the demand becomes more than the supply, you are in a shortage scenario and you are going to get yourself into trouble. So the virgin's demand is dictated by the viewing distance, interpupillary distance and heterophoria. Virgin supply is dictated by the fusional virgin's reserves and to some extent through the accommodation in the ACA crosslink. In a healthy binocular vision system, your virgin's demand is always lesser than the virgin's supply. In other words, even if there is a phoria, that phoria is well within the fusional virgin's range that you can to compensate for that demand. Now in exophoria, the convergence demand increases uh, and, uh, and this produces an additional load on the fusional virgins. So now as long as this demand is within reasonable limits, the fusional virgins can still handle it. But if the load becomes even more, then the fusional virgin system starts getting into troublesome scenarios. So Esophoria is the opposite scenario. As long as the divergence demand is within the limits of negative fusional virgins, you are fine. But when it exceeds a certain threshold, you start having problems. It is in these two scenarios, your esophoria and exophoria scenarios, where the balance is tilted in the direction of the demand, is when patients will start experiencing asthenotic problems and come to see you in your clinic. Now, based on the supply demand relationship, you can roughly categorize the kinds of deviations that you are seeing into a continuum. The ideal case scenario, as I described earlier, is orthophoria, where, the, where you are very much on the surplus end of things. At near orthophoria means that your accommodation is completely taking care of your virgin's demands and you really don't have any additional load on the virgin system. If the ACA ratio is, a, is, is away from the ideal scenario, you start experiencing a little bit of ESO or exophoria. This additional demand that is there in the system is still manageable as long as the supply is uh, large enough. But when the demand sort of starts even more further increasing, when the phoria status starts increasing, you now have and load an additional load on the fusional virgin system. And that's when you will start manifesting your non-strabismic BB disorder. So asthenopic symptoms, difficulty in reading, doubling of uh, letters when you read for prolonged periods of time, nausea, whatnot. Vinisha will cover all of this in greater detail in her next talk. If that continuum gets pushed a little bit more 
then you now have the demand increasing a little bit more and the supply is dwindling a, a further, you get an intermittent tropia. The fusional virgin system is no longer able to hold the ice together. Occasionally it breaks down and you start experiencing tropia symptoms. So the worst case scenario in all of this is your full blown tropia where the demand is so high and the supply has gotten completely depleted and the patient just presents to you with a full blown uh, ESO or an exotropia. The most obvious scenario, we discussed that in the last uh, session a little bit, uh, is that of an accommodative esotrope where there is so much convergence that is produced because of a high ACA ratio. There is no way that your negative fusional virgin system can take care of that much of demand that is there. So in my mind, it is fairly intuitive to think about the various kinds of uh, oculomotor uh, deviations that we see into this continuum. I don't think they represent very different mechanisms. The pathophysiology may be different, but from a supply demand continuum, these, these uh, uh, different conditions still fall within the continuum of things. So, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, so, so yeah, so the reason I put this up was if you are in the right end in the green zone where the supply is very, very high and the demand is very, very low, you are in the green zone, you really do not have any problems at all. Uh, if you are in the red zone here where your demand is very, very high, uh, essentially because of four years or your supply is very low because of uh, lower fusional virgins, then you do experience tropias, intermittent tropias and all of that. If you are in the yellow zone here, where the, sub the supply is, uh, is slightly shorter than the demand, you end up experiencing non strabismic BV disorder. So it turns out that your prism prescriptions that you do in the clinic are also uh, based on the same supply demand relationship. You may be familiar with your Sheard's criteria or your Percival's criteria for prism prescription. Without going into the details of it, what both these criteria are telling you is uh, the Sheard's is telling you the magnitude of phoria should not be greater than half of your fusional virgins. So essentially saying that your demand should be one half of your supply. Yes. So if that balance is getting tilted, prescribe a prism that would get it back into that, uh, uh, into that balance state. The Percival's criteria, also known as the middle third criteria, exactly tells you the same thing. If you now look at the positive and the negative fusional virgins as one large range of supply that I have, is your demand in the central one third of that supply? If the demand is outside of that central one third, then you want to prescribe a prism in order to get it back into the central one third. All of them, in fact, are essentially pointing to the same fundamental concept in economics that your supply should always be at least half of more than your demand is. Indians are great at doing that. We tend to be savers. We tend to put a lot of things uh, in our surplus and the same strategy we should be following as far as managing these binocular vision disorders are also concerned. So in summary, distance heterophoria is a result of the physiological, the muzzle tonicity being different from the parallel position of view. Near heterophoria is determined by the ACA ratio to a large extent. The distance phoria is mostly ortho due to the process of orthophorization, while the near phoria is typically exo because your ideal, your measured ACA ratio is lesser than your ideal ACA ratio. The supply versus demand relationship is a good way of thinking about heterophoria and fusional virgins, where the heterophoria is the demand on the system, fusional virgins is the supply. Um, and NSBVD, non strabismic BV disorders, may arise because of the mismatch in the supply demand relationship. Uh, with that, I end and I would like to thank you again for your attention and hand it over to uh, the moderator for a question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Shrikan, for that wonderful talk on different types of phorias and the important role of heterophoria on binocular visual system. So now I'm forwarding the question to Dr. Shrikan, which are asked by our participants. Yes, Vidisha. Yeah, so still now we didn't get any question, but we got a request from uh, Dr. Rizwana that uh, to throw some light on the role of disparity and tonic virgins in infantile isotropia, as these systems are quite amenable to modification in the cross-link through yeah. optical modalities. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 
Uh, thanks, Rizwana, for that question. I'm going to go all the way back to my first couple of slides. Right. So in the uh, in the model here, the framework that we have set up here, the infant system is a very very interesting system to actually think about now go back and recall that infants are typically born hyperopic so there is a increased accommodative demand that the infants are experiencing and at the same time the infants ipd is also smaller so they have a narrower ipd and from the present talk you would have uh, uh, understood that the virgin's demand is therefore smaller so the infants are by default in a disharmony state the disharmony is that there is excess accommodation that is to be there and there is very little virgins demand that is there because of the ipd issue now how are they going to manage this scenario and get clear and single vision most infants do uh, come out uh, having clear and single vision and the way they do that in our mind is by biasing themselves towards the virgin system they have a higher cac ratio compared to an ACA ratio and the entire world and the entire binocular system of infants is very much biased towards the disparity system and the logic is uh, is fairly straightforward if you have a strong CA component even if you do a little bit of convergence you are going to produce a lot of accommodation and that's really what you want you want a small convergence to happen because the IPD is very narrow but you want a lot of accommodation to happen because you now have a large hyperopia. So the infant system is invariably biased towards the CA system. And, and how am I so confidently saying that is when you cover one eye of the infant and have them accommodate, they practically do not accommodate at all. One sure shot way to annoy an infant and, and you guys in the clinic will probably know this more than I do is by occluding one eye. And, and we find that binocularly how well they are doing, they are not as efficient at doing things monocularly. So that's one uh, strategy that infants follow. The second is their tonic systems are essentially adaptive systems. And I didn't emphasize too much on this. The tonic systems are meant for sustaining accommodation and virgins for a long period of time. Uh, the phasic systems get you to the desired position immediately but they cannot sustain the system for a long period of time. Whereas the tonic systems can sustain it for extended periods of time. So if you are quickly changing your viewing from one distance to another, it is the phasic component that drives your accommodation and virgins. Whereas if you are doing reading for a long period of time or a near work for a long period of time, it's your tonic systems that they are uh, taking over. These tonic systems are adaptive systems. They can change their values over a period of time to take care of the demands that are there in the system. So one other way to think about this is if the infants have a very, very adaptable tonic accommodation and tonic virgin system in order to take care of this disharmony. Uh, the tonic adaptation that I'm talking about for uh, Preeta asked this question earlier. Uh, in the context of her question, the tonic adaptation is really what we look at in the clinic as your prism adaptation or your lens adaptation. You prescribe a prism for a, a relieving prism for that individual, they come back, eat up all the prisms and they come back with the same Fourier view. That's because the tonic system has interpreted that as an additional demand on the system and has adapted its properties. So both the strategy of biasing yourself to convergence and also by adjusting the properties of the tonic accommodation and tonic virgins, you can effectively address the disharmony between accommodation and virgins. Children are great examples of that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shrikant. Another one question uh, asks, when a patient has a maximum plus refraction and looks from distance to near, how does the accommodation stimulus or response card predict the amount of accommodative change? When the person has maximum plus refraction and when they change from distance, distance to, to near, near, yes. How, how does the accommodation stimulus getting changed? So, yeah, so the, the hyperopia is a, is a good, I, I assume, okay, so there are two ways to interpret this question. The maximum plus refraction would mean that either they are in an uncorrected state or they are, you have already corrected them for the distance uh, refraction. 
Now, the uncorrected state is the example of the hyperopia that we spoke about in the previous session. The uncorrected two diopters of hyperopia or whatever amount of hyperopia will stimulate the accommodative system and drive the convergence leading to a lot of uh, ESO deviations and stuff. But once you correct this patient with the desired amount of spectacles and stuff, so you're effectively restoring the system back to its normal state. As far as the patient is concerned, he is now in corrected emetrope. And the, the interaction between the two systems will be restored to its normalcy once you have that person completely corrected for their refractive error. I hope I answered that question uh, reasonably. Yeah. So we can take another one question that uh, asks, uh, can it possible that patient can show exophoria for distance and exophoria for near? Oh, most certainly, they can show whatever you want. So uh, you, they can most certainly show an exophoria for distance and ESO for near and one conceivable way they can show this is through the very high ACA ratio for a minute. So their physiological state of rest uh, that defines the distance heterophoria may be lesser than what is required and that may manifest as an exophoria for distance. But because they have a very high ACA ratio that produces all that extra convergence that you want driving the eye into an ESO uh, deviated uh, position. In some ways, this is what you see in the case of a uh, uh, in the case of a convergence excess. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, in the case of a uh, in, in, in case of one of the non-strabismic BV disorders that Vidisha will talk about, where there is more or less an orthophoria for uh, distance, and you could have an esophoria for near. So that can most certainly happen. And that can happen in the case of someone with a high ACA ratio. Yeah. Another one question that uh, which method of prescribing prism is more acceptable, Schreer's or Parsifal? And another one, Dowd also she has that do we take the blur value or break in that formula? For, for prescription of that prisms? Yes. Uh, I am actually going to defer this question to either you or uh, Nandini because it's a very clinical question and I and I do not have that uh, clinical wisdom to answer this. So maybe if either of you can take it, that will actually be quite nice. Nandini, you want to take it or Vidisha? Yeah. Um, so actually, if you look at references, for, uh, there are references that say Sheards is good for X. So and Percival is good for ESO. Um, typically, you just, the, the fundamental idea is this. Um, for most part, we try to give vision therapy before we jump in and give prisms, okay? Because we don't, we want the person to utilize whatever muscle function that they can use in order to overcome their EXO or the ESO. EXO is very amenable to a uh, lot of therapy. So that's why your convergence insufficiency treatment trial has shown excellent results with vision therapy. So we don't jump in and give a prism right away. We tend to give the prism when the double vision is sort of, you know, coming in more frequently and patient is not able to do it. They don't have time for exercise. And then you want to give the prisms. Um, personally, I use shears. I, I feel it's like sort of more easier to uh, understand and I try to give the minimum prism and then see uh, what will enable them to fuse. And then on top of it, I would still give them additional exercises. Different practitioners may have different style in doing this. Uh, one time I asked uh, Dr. Jim Sheedy and he was telling me that the per Percival and the Sheards criteria were also arbitrary in any case. So there isn't a very strong scientific evidence to go one way or the other. We can take the next question, Vidisha. Yes, the next question is, how will you measure tonic accommodation and tonic virgins? Uh, the lighter example that you cannot do now is travel in an airplane. The more serious example of this is, remember what I was uh, saying, in order for you to measure tonic accommodation or tonic virgins, you probably want the person to be in a complete uh, state of darkness. Now, that's the stimulus requirement that is needed to do that. Uh, in a clinical setup, it is not that straightforward to measure the tonic accommodation and virgins. Uh, 
in a laboratory setting we measure this using um, auto refractors and using your uh, eye tracker so now remember that if any time that you shine a light into the eye a visible light into the eye that acts as a stimulus for the accommodative system and you don't want visible light therefore to be entering into the eye so when you if you decide to do retinoscopy as a measure of tonic accommodation it's not going to work for you because you are using visible light to stimulate the accommodative system instead in an auto refractor that tends to use infrared light typically in the order of 850 nanometers or 900 nanometers so the light is not as visible as the uh, visible as, as as in the visible spectrum so the accommodative system is still not stimulated and you can still get a measure of the refractive state of the eye uh, using your auto refractor so for tonic vergence measurements you would really need to have an eye tracker that will basically tell you what the uh, deviated position of the eye is in order to get an estimate of whether it is in an eso direction or in an exo direction yeah another one question was asked um, by mohan raj that exactly in which part of the brain all these systems like phasic tonic and feedback takes yeah. a place yeah yeah no great question uh, mohan i i am glad you asked this question because in the way i described all this model it seems like uh, it, it is this model takes a very engineering approach to things uh, it doesn't connect you to the anatomical uh, regions that is there uh specifically which part of the brain where all of these cells are are uh, present is in the midbrain area so if you if you see my video i am actually turning it you know turning my head around and i am pointing to the part of the skull where uh, part of my head where the skull really ends and all of you can sort of feel that and you can see the region where the skull is ending now if you go deeper into that region that's the region of the midbrain where pretty much every one of your cranial nerve nuclei are sitting now it is that region which extends downwards as your spinal cord so within the midbrain region you have your third nerve nucleus your fourth nerve your sixth nerve nuclei and stuff the third nerve nuclei is really the one that drives your near response the edinger westphal nucleus is a specialized region of the third nerve nucleus that is meant for driving accommodative responses the so pretty much the entire action of phasic controllers tonic controllers all of these are in the midbrain region in and around your third nerve nucleus and your edinger westphal nucleus but one point to remember though uh, mohan is uh, this part of the brain the third nerve nucleus and edinger westphal nucleus these are what we call as the final common pathway what the, what i mean by that is whenever blur or disparity is sensed by the system there is an other parts of the brain that sort of uh, that sort of interprets this uh, interpretation happens in the form of how much i should accommodate and in what direction i should accommodate should i increase my accommodation or should i decrease my accommodation all of this happens at a much higher level in your brain and areas like frontal eye fields and and almost in almost in the frontal cortex are involved in these calculations once those once those areas have decided how much i should accommodate and how uh, in what direction i need to accommodate or convert the information is sent from there to the midbrain for producing the final response so as far as this model is concerned all of what we are talking about is in the midbrain region whereas when real accommodation is concerned you also have to take into consideration other areas of the brain like frontal eye fields um and uh, the the median uh, lateral uh, the median vestibular nucleus and stuff to uh, produce those responses so i hope that you already cleared all the doubts so i think this is the time to move for the further presentation thank you dr shrikan once again thank you thank you so much uh, uh, bidisha and uh, in fact uh, i would like to sort of introduce you as the next speaker for this session um, he is also an optometrist from uh, by training from uh, kolkata from the west bengal university of technology and after that she did her uh, specialized fellowship in uh, neuro optometry uh, from shankar netralia and for the past uh, couple of years she has been working with us at lvp as an assistant optometrist in our visakhapatnam campus 
and uh, uh, she will now be talking about the overview and classification of non strabismic BV disorders. Off to you, Vidisha. Thank you, Dr. Shrikan. So, good afternoon to all. I hope all the participants enjoy throughout the discussions till now. So, after having a brief discussion regarding importance of refraction in binocular vision and the relation and interaction between accommodation and virgins. Now this is the high time for implementation of all your thoughts into the clinic. So the topic of discussion for now is non-strabismic binocular disorder. So the learning objective for today's session is you will be able to analyze the signs and symptoms of different NSBVD and able to describe the overall principle involved the management of these disorders. So now coming to what is non-strabismic binocular disorder is. So accommodative and binocular vision disorders are the second most common visual disorder in the clinical pediatric population only next to the refractive anomalies. As we all know that reading involves both accommodation and virgence mechanism and an imbalance between the sensory motor integrative functions result in non strabismic binocular disorder. So from band study, we came to know that the overall prevalence of NSVBD in India is 29.6% in rural population and 31.5% in urban population, where the convergence insufficiency and accommodative infertility were found to be the most common disorder. So it mostly affects the school age children and especially high school learner and those who work with computers for a longer period of time because they have all increased demand for the uses of accommodation and version system. The common symptoms can be like headache, eye strain, focusing difficulty, intermittent blur or double vision after prolonged near work. Coming to the classification of NSPBD, AC by A ratio is a critical determinant of the relationship between the distance and the near deviations, which plays an important role in part of case analysis. On the other side, measurement of AC by A ratio provides an insight into the relative strength of the crosslink from the accommodative system to the virgin system. Hence, it is one of the most common clinical evaluations. Based on AC by A ratio, NHBVD can be classified into three main categories. So in the previous lecture, we already discussed regarding the relationship between the FOIA and the AC by A ratio. So hence, I'm not going to explain this thing again. So just to recap, convergence and divergence insufficiency will fall under low AC by A ratio, where convergence excess and divergence excess will fall under high AC by A ratio. The fusional virgence dysfunction and basic exophoria and basic isophoria will fall under normal AC by A ratio. So now I am requesting everyone, please get ready with your all prerequisite knowledge that will help you to diagnose NHBVD based on the clinical features. In the subsequent slides, I am going to give you some ideas regarding the signs and symptoms and you people have to diagnose that patient based on their clinical features. Coming to the first scenario, here one patient was complaining of intermittent blur or double vision for near along with other asthenopic symptoms. The signs were near exophoria is more than the distance, receded NPC and reduced positive fusional versions for near. So now I'm going to give you a few seconds time to write your answer in the chat box. Then we will discuss about the possible diagnosis. And Dr. Premnandini is the moderator for this session. So Dr. Premnandini, can you please check the chat box? Yeah, I think everybody is coming up with convergence insufficiency as the answer. Yes, nice. Thank you for your response. Here I'm adding another one additional sign that patient is having reduced binocular accommodative facility, difficulty to clear with the plus lenses. And yes, the diagnosis is convergence insufficiency. So basically it is a condition in which a patient finds it's difficult to sustain convergence that may cause a person to look with just one eye at a time or to see double. 
So basically in convergence insufficiency, the virgins demand is exophoria and the supply is positive fusional virgins. So in this particular case, the demand is high as compared to the supply and that will affect their binocularity. Coming to the differential diagnosis for convergence insufficiency. So the differential diagnosis for convergence insufficiency are basic exophoria and divergence excess. So let's discuss what are the common and differential factors among these three NSBBD. So we already know that we are having nega reduced positive fusional virgin supply. Hence, in the three NSBBD, they will have less amount of virgins facility. They will have problem to converge their eye with the base out prism. Coming to the differential factors among these three NHBBT. First, we can consider the fovea measurement. In convergence insufficiency, we already know that the near exophoria will be more than the distance and that will affect their uh, symptoms also. So there we, they will have the intermittent blur or double vision for the near. Where in basic exophoria, the magnitude of exophoria will be equal for both distance and near. So the patient can have same type of symptom both for distance and near. Coming to the divergence excess, we already know that the distance uh, magnitude of distance exophoria will be more than the near and patient can have outer deviation of eyeball for distance as a symptoms. Coming to the second scenario, here one patient was particularly complaining of intermittent or constant double vision for distance. So the signs are distance exophoria for more than the near reduce negative fusional virgins for the distance and also patient is having difficulty to diverge their eye with the basin prism for the distance. Again, I'm going to give you few seconds time to write your answer in the chat box. Then we will discuss about the possible diagnosis. Yeah. So uh, I think most of them wrote divergence insufficiency. Okay, so for them, again, I'm adding another one clue. With the virgins parameter, I'm adding another one uh, accommodative parameters that patient was having binocularly reduced accommodative facility. They will have problem to stimulate their accommodation. So, yes, thank you for the responses. So the actual diagnosis can be divergence insufficiency. So divergence insufficiency is a condition in which, uh, in where the patient... Uh, finds difficulty to sustain their divergence and that will end up as a double vision. So now, what can be the differential diagnosis for divergence insufficiency? If you want to think, you can think, you can correlate with the first scenario also. So these are the two differential diagnoses for divergence insufficiency. These two are basic exophoria, isophoria and convergence excess. So again, we are going to discuss about the common and differential factors among these three NSBVD. As we already know, patient is having a problem to diverge their eye because the supply of negative fusional virgins is reduced. So obviously they will have some problem to facilitate. So they will have problem to fuse with basin prism in three NSBVD cases. Coming to the differential factors among these three NSBVD, we can consider the first phoria measurement that is very much important. In divergence insufficiency, distance isophoria is more than the near and that's why in that way, patient can have the double vision problem intermittently or constant for the distance. Coming to the basic isophoria, the magnitude of isophoria will be equal for both distance and near. Based on the how much phoria they have and distance and near, they can have the overlapping of images problem, headache problem, other kind of asthenopic symptoms. Coming to the convergence excess, the near isophoria will be more than the distance. So in a uh, patient can have the overla overlapping of images, headache and other kind of asthenopic symptoms for near only. So coming to the third scenario here. So here one patient was complaining of both eyes blurring of vision for near. In that case, patient uh, anterior segment and posterior segment both were uh, within normal limit. The signs were flick esophoria for near. Patient was having reduced amplitude of accommodation and positive relative accommodation. And along with that, patient has reduced accommodative facility also. And they are having difficulty to stimulate their accommodation. So from here, can you able to think once again and please write your response in the chat box. He just uh, one particular clue that patient is having amplitude of reduced amplitude of accommodation. Then again, we will discuss what is can be the possible diagnosis.
the overwhelming response we are getting is accommodative insufficiency yes i'm happy that uh, this participants are here are giving a very nice response and correct response so accommodative insufficiency is a case where the patient is having very less amount of accommodative supply and that will uh, affect their to see our object clearly so now coming to the differential diagnosis for accommodative insufficiency so today in this presentation we we, we are going to discuss about what is the common differential diagnosis for accommodative insufficiency so these are the two very common and important differential diagnosis for accommodative insufficiency these two are pseudo convergence insufficiency and accommodative infelicity so pseudo convergence insufficiency is a condition where virgin system got disrupted due to having very less supply of accommodative system so now we can discuss what can be the common factors between the accommodative insufficiency and pseudo convergence insufficiency so the name itself we come to know in accommodative insufficiency patient will have less supply of accommodative system that will reflect in the mem also so in both the cases patient will have high lag of accommodation along with that reduced amplitude of accommodation and another one important thing due to having the uh, very less amount of accommodative supply the virgin system also getting disrupted so patient can have reduced virgin facility in both the cases and obviously uh, with that patient will have difficulty to stimulate their accommodation and they will have uh, binocularly reduced accommodative facility difficulty with minus lenses coming to the differential factors among these three nls vpd first we can consider the phobia measurement in accommodative insufficiency we already know that accommodation is not working properly hence the convergence is trying to do a overwork to see a single uh, that object single and clear so patient can develop near isophoria for near but in pseudo convergence insufficiency patient will have exophoria for the near and accommodative infelicity there is no uh, direct relation with the virgin system hence patient can have orthophoria for both distance and near coming to the accommodative facility part in accommodative insufficiency and pseudo convergence insufficiency we already know patient will have uh, some insufficient amount of accommodation so that's why they are not able to stimulate their accommodation so that's why they will have difficulty to clear with the minus lenses but in accommodative infelicity they will have some certain amount of amplitude but the facility will be reduced and patient will not able to relax and stimulate their accommodation so whenever in orthoptic clinic whenever you were just dealing with any patients so please uh, please kindly compare all the signs uh, symptoms with the differential diagnosis and that will give you a proper conclusion coming to the management part of all that nls bbd this is the vision therapy sequencing for binocular vision dysfunction which is taken from uh, lenot press at all applied concept in vision therapy so initially we have to start with the monocular exercises followed by the binocular exercises we have to equalize the visual skill between the two eyes when we are in the initial stage we have to start the exercise with the seropsis training then we have to move towards the flat fusion so in the very early stage we can uh, start our exercise with the big target then we have to choose the linear target linear target to develop the um, uh, excessive virgins demand then we have to continue the ranges fusion and in the third phase we have to give some jump duction exercise to train their virgins fertility along with some accommodative exercises so in the end stage of the uh, techniques or the last uh, sessions of vision therapy we should provide the virgins as well as the accommodation exercises also at the end along, along with the virgins and accommodation training we can give some auditory and vestibular training to sustain their sensory system coming to the management part of all type of nls pvd here i am going to explain this in a tabular form in convergence insufficiency so patient will have some uh, intermittent blur or double vision problem for the near so basically we can start uh, vision therapy then secondary option prism can be given in convergence excess 
so initially the plus lenses should be given to relax their accommodation then when the patient will come for a follow up and we will see there is an improvement in symptoms vision therapy can be provided in divergence access vision therapy can be provided as a primary uh, management then minus lens can be given to increase their convergence divergence insufficiency so from the uh, second scenario we already come to know patients will have some double vision problem for the distance so initially we can give some base out prisms for temporary purpose and then we will call the patient after three weeks or four weeks if we will see that their symptoms are getting improved vision therapy can be provided in esophoria the management will be quite same as convergence excess and basic exophoria the management will be uh, quite same as divergence excess Fusional divergence dysfunction. This is a type of NSBD where the patient will having both the problem to convergence and divergence. Hence, they will, they may not develop a double vision for both distance and near. Hence, vision therapy can be provided. In accommodative insufficiency, we already know patient does not have the enough amount of accommodation to see a object single clear. So we can add some plus lenses for a temporary purpose. Then along uh, in the secondary option, we can start some vision therapy exercises like. Accommodative flipper heart chart kind of accommodative excess and accommodative intrusivity vision therapy can be provided as a best management. So till now we already come to know that what are the common and uncommon disorder are uh, there, and what are the vision therapies or the management are uh, can be provided in all type of NSVPD. So these are the. Uh, uh, Virtual exercise and accommodative exercises are available in our orthoptics clinic. These are the three computerized exercises for virgins and accommodation. In vision therapy VTS post system, multiple choice virgins, jump duction can be used to train their virgins anomalies, whereas the accommodative rock option can be used to train their accommodative anomalies. Try software that is developed by Shankar Netralaya and Binox software that is developed by Mohammad Oliullah. These two software can be used to train virgins and accommodation both and these two software can be used for both in office as well as home vision therapy so coming to our real case scenario so one patient had reported to our orthoptics clinic with the complaining of both eye focusing difficulty from near to distance since four months after 15 to 20 minutes of prolonged near work so i am just requesting all the participant to give a concentration particularly on the main complaint in comprehensive eye examination, he was found to have best corrected visual acuity 2020 and N6 for 30 centimeter and anterior posterior segment was within under within normal limit. So we have done the orthoptics evaluation and we found that patient was having orthophoria for both distance and near. Patient was having reduced uh, neg negative relative accommodation and positive relative accommodation and they are having both reduce uh, binocularly and monocularly accommodative facility they are not able to relax their accommodation as well as not able to stimulate their accommodation so again i'm requesting all the participants can you please write your response in the chat box that what can be the possible diagnosis for this patient so i'm just give you uh, going to give you two clues in accommodative insufficiency already we came to know that patient is having less amount of uh, accommodation supply hence they are not able to clear with the minus lenses so that will be the opposite thing in accommodative excess patient they are not able to relax their accommodation hence they will have some problem with the plus lenses but this scenario patient is having both the problem so what can be the uh, possible diagnosis for this type of patient i think uh, people jumped on this even before getting your clue or even seeing the signs they all said accommodative insufficiency Okay, it's very nice. So that final diagnosis is accommodative infacility. So this is a condition where patient uh, having the less amount of facility, although having a good amount of amplitude of accommodation. So in other, another way, they have that accommodation power, but they are not able to utilize it in proper way. So uh, in the, uh, the differential diagnosis for accommodative insufficiency can be accommodative uh, insufficiency, uh, accommodative excess, and uh, basic exophoria. But uh, there is not much relation between these other uh, NSBVDs with the AIF. So I'm not going to uh, discuss regarding this thing. So I'm going to the management part that 
10 session of vision therapy so initially uh, we just that patient was recommended for 10 session of vision therapy and that we generally do in our orthoptics clinic and this idea we got from the band study that was done by dr rizwana at all so the orthoptics evaluation was done as pre and post so these are the parameters you please uh, take a concentration there there's a significant improvement in the nra pra and accommodative facility values and and these are the values are quite near to the normative data in individual population which was established by dr rizwana at all in her band study so the impression was the patient uh, improved their bv parameters and instead of uh, doing that 12 weeks of in office continuously vision therapy which was proposed by shyman at all and the earlier we can give 10 session of vision therapy then home vision therapy can be prescribed for another three months the expected um, improvement in the symptoms and as well as the bb parameters are quite same what the uh, shaman has mentioned in their vision therapy papers so in these cases also we had done the same management we just prescribed the accommodative flipper plus minus two to do the exercises at home for another three months and we call the patient after three months so the take home message for today's class can be so whenever you are going to deal the patients in the orthoptics clinic and you are suspecting any diagnosis like convergence insufficiency or divergence insufficiency so i would recommend to compare the signs and symptoms with their differential diagnosis and that will help you to give a proper diagnosis and i really want to say that line once again phobia status should not be the only criteria for diagnosis a case of nsvvd so based on the patient's clinical feature mode of treatment can be varied in convergence insufficiency that dr shrikant already mentioned that if the patient is having frequent um, sorry i think dr P, uh, premnandini so she mentioned that if the patient is complaining of, uh, of frequent double vision or intermittent blur for the near so instead of going directly to the vision therapy we should give some relieving prism then we will call the patient after 3 weeks then we can think about the vision therapies so these are the three table i am going to show you this can be used as a reference and that will give you an idea to give a proper diagnosis kindly have a quick look on that thank you for paying attention throughout my presentation uh, thank you vidisha i think you nicely engaged with our participants they were very responsive and uh, giving you all the correct answers overwhelmingly uh, so we can take some questions one of the before i go to the question one of the uh, participants said it will be nice if someone can share the full article of ban study as it was cited many times so we do have the author of the ban study as a one of our participants jamil rizwana hussain din she it was actually a part of her phd i think from shankar nekwalia so definitely i would request uh, rizwana if she can put the link for everyone to look at the wonderful papers that you published um it will be good for others to sort of get a reference it's it's a good study in the sense that it comes out as your indian data because many a times we had to rely on morgan's values caucasian values and uh, we weren't sure if what we were using is right okay so yeah rizwana says uh, she'll be happy to share so we'll take some questions now if people have questions feel free to type in so one question for you vidisha is can you uh, someone is asking if you can explain again pseudo convergence insufficiency yes uh thank you for that question so this is a very rare condition when an accommodative insufficiency is the primary cause for developing the pseudo convergence insufficiency problem so patient is having very less amount of accommodative supply that will affect their amplitude of accommodation and we already know accommodation cannot work without virgin system cannot work without the accommodative system so whenever you are going to focus a particular object for near so your virgin system as well as accommodation are working together so when you were seeing that accommodative insufficiency is more and the virgins is also trying to overcome this and he is also not getting a try uh, and patient is also seeing that uh, object as a very blur and patient is not able to fuse it that condition is called the pseudo convergence insufficiency so uh, due to having very less amount of accommodation the virgins load 
was getting high and patient was having the more exophoria for the near and in this type of uh, cases so in year that um, due to having very lag of uh, high lag of accommodation patient will have the problem with the stimulus of accommodation also in pseudo why it is called pseudo convergence insufficiency because the patient will having near exophoria for near and for that here demand is high but the supply will be less so positive fusional virgin supply will be less in particular this type of patient and when amplitude is less that will affect the virgin's facility also the patient will have problem to converge their eye with the base out prism so that way that's uh, pseudo convergence insufficiency is a secondary cause of accommodative insufficiency the links for uh, uh, the band study is being shared by shrikant so people can look at that uh, somebody said please project slide 18 and 19 once so vidisha can you go there while we take another question uh somebody is also asked can you please explain uh, fusional virgins dysfunction yeah so fusional virgins dysfunction is a condition where the patient will have problem to diverge and convergent uh, divergence and convergent their eyes so in that particular cases patient will have orthophoria for both distance and near okay and they will uh, have some problem with the because we already know that nra and pra is a indirect measurement of fusional virgins so indirectly that will also can get affected and then we know that the demand is high and the supply for negative fusional virgins and for fusional virgins are less so that will affect the virgins facility also patient will not able to diverge their eye with the basin prism patient will not able to converge their eye with the base out prism so that will affect the binocular uh, accommodative facility also they will not able to uh, stimulate their accommodation or they will not able to uh, relax their accommodation that is uh, so for for uh, i think irene was asking for slide number 18 and 19 what we will also do is we will share this uh, these uh, tables that vidisha has created we can share that with the participants so um, you will get it either through the recordings at a later time and we can also share it uh, share these tables with you so not an issue uh, so don't worry in case if the slides are sort of you know you, have, you haven't copied it or anything um there is one a uh, question that says in case of accommodative insufficiency why esophoria is present for near now um i'll take this question because it seems like a little tricky question in terms of it, it's a very generic question there isn't any mention of what's the age and uh, what, what exactly if if the person who's asking the question has come across a case like this because in general we expect that if somebody has accommodative insufficiency then you probably would expect to see an exo uh my take on this in case if you have seen a patient like this is that uh probably they would have had much more eso if they had not had the accommodative insufficiency because at a basal state like what uh, i think what shrikant was mentioning in his talk your physiological state or act, the actual phoria position uh, 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 for somebody would be known at the you know if they are dead or when the tonicity is completely relaxed so not everybody has to show an exo or an eso everyone has a combination a variation of this so my take on this would be that if somebody is having accommodative insufficiency and in spite of that if they are showing an eso then i would think that if they have not had that accommodative insufficiency they probably would have had much more eso than what we are seeing Vidisha, you have any thoughts on this question? Uh, no, Doctor Premnandini. That same thing I also explained in my uh, accommodative insufficiency slide. So it's uh, nice to hear that all the participants hear the presentation nicely. Thank you for all the responses. Okay, that is another question. It says how uh, how is accommodative infertility different from fusional virgin's dysfunction? Yeah. so in basically accommodative in uh, accommodative infertility uh, so their patient will have some problem in the relaxation and stimulation but i already mentioned there is no direct relation with the virgin system so in accommodative infertility patient will have normal uh, range of pfv and nfv but where is in fusional virgin's dysfunction patient will have reduced supply of negative and fusional uh, negative and positive fusional virgin supply there is another question it says if we see a patient with receded npc 
and reduced uh, base out ranges how to differentiate whether it is ci or pseudo ci Yes, uh, thank you for the question. But uh, this two uh, that what you mentioned about these two BV parameters, it was quite sh shown the direct idea of having convergence insufficiency. But particularly in pseudo convergence insufficiency, we have to see the accommodative parameter first. So in normal accommodative in uh, convergence insufficiency, patient will have a normal range of accommodation, and they can have the plus lens difficulty monocularly and the binocularly. But particularly in pseudo convergence insufficiency. Insufficiency. This is due to accommodative insufficiency. Patient will have high lag of accommodation, and as well as problem in stimulate their accommodation. So generally, patient will have difficulty with the minus lenses. And another one uh, common factors between that is, uh, CI and the pseudo CI that is virgins facility because in both the cases we are having less amount of positive fusional virgins. So hence that will affect their virgins facility also. Okay, I think uh, that is all we have in terms of the questions asked. I hope I have uh, covered everyone's question here. So if there are no more questions, I would like to thank Vidisha for the talk and for engaging with the audience nicely. All right, so fantastic, great discussions, good points that have come out. I think uh, all of you already are very sharp with your clinical skills in the way you all answered. Uh, so this was a very lively interactive sen session. So we will break now and we will join in exactly one hour. Thank you very much.